chapter one of the spanish conquerors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond chapter one west and east wherefore we may judge that those persons who connect the region in the neighbourhood of the pillars of hercules spain with that towards india and who assert that in this way the sea is one do not assert things very improbable aristotle de silo two fourteen the spaniard of the fifteenth century is recognisable by well-defined traits he was primitive he was proud he was devout and he was romantic his primitiveness we detect in his relish for blood and suffering his pride in his austerity and exclusiveness his devoutness in his mystical exaltation of the church and his romanticism in his passion for adventure after printing had spread in spain the romanticism of the spaniard to confine our observations for the present to that trait was fostered by a wealth of books amadis of gaul paul marin of england the exploits of esplandion don Bellanis. all these works were filled with heroes queens monsters and enchantments and all it is needless to remark held an honoured place upon the shelves of miguel de cervantes that spanish romanticist par excellence the author of don quixote but prior to fifteen hundred or down to fourteen ninety two let us say the romanticism of the spaniard like that of other europeans was ministered to not so much by books as by tales pass from mouth to mouth tales originating with seamen and reflected in the names on mariners charts and tales by landsmen recorded in the relations reports and letters of missionaries royal envoys and itinerant merchants to the west of spain stretched the atlantic ocean and in the atlantic the lands most remote were the canaries the madeiras the cape verde group and the azores what was beyond the canaries the madeiras the cape verde group and the azores to this the answer was not so far as known save the atlantic itself the mare tenembrosum or sea of darkness a sea so called for the very reason that within it lies hid whatever land there may be beyond these islands west of ireland but east of the longitude of the azores seamen said was to be found the island of brazil west of the canaries and also west of the longitude of the azores the great island of antilia and southwest of the cape verde group at an indeterminate distance the island of st brandon concerning brazil except that the name signified red or orange-coloured dyewood particulars were lacking but antilia the island over against the island opposite had been the refuge had it not of the iberian goths after their defeat by the moors and here two archbishops of orporto with five bishops had founded seven cities st brandon too was the subject of somewhat specific affirmation for in quest of this island had not st brandon abbot of eilek in the sixth century put fearlessly to sea with a band of monks nor were the islands mentioned all of those for which seamen vouched there were besides isla de mam man island salvaggio savage island alias le man de santanaxio hand of satan insula in mar island of the sea rayella king island and various others some of these islands it was surmised must be the abode of life if not life of the type of the hydras and gorgons of antiquity at least of a type of extra mundane and weird 
of amazons of men with tails of anthropophagi and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders of crouching calibans of mermaids and of singing aerials and amid uncertainties respecting antilia and her protean sisterhood one certainty stood out in considerable numbers these islands had figured boldly on marine charts of accepted authority from the famed catalan of thirteen seventy five to the Bacaria of fourteen thirty five and the benincasas of fourteen sixty three fourteen seventy six and fourteen eighty two noteworthy as were the yarns spun by seamen in the fifteenth century tales circulated by landsmen by missionaries royal envoys and merchants were more noteworthy still but these missionaries and other landsmen whither did they fare in what quarter did they adventure not in the west for that was the seamen's realm but in the east these travellers had their domain the chief potentate in all asia so europe believed was prester john a christian and a rich man to find him or some equivalent of him and bring him into helpful relationship with christian but distracted europe became the ambition of popes and secular rulers alike hence the missionaries hence friar john of pion de carpine and friar william of rubruck who from twelve forty five to twelve fifty three penetrated central asia to caracocum hence furthermore john of monte corvino ordoric of pordenone and john of marignoli who as friars and papal legates from twelve seventy five to thirteen fifty three visited persia india the malay archipelago china and even tibet the tales these landsmen brought were good to hear pretty to hear tell as friar odoric puts it first there was cathay cathay of the mongol plains with its khans or emperors housed in tents twanging guitars and disdainful of all mankind cathay of the ocean sea with ports thronged with ships and wharves glutted with costly wares cathay of the city of kinsay stretched like paradise through the breadth of heaven with lake canals bridges pleasure barges baths and lights of love cathay of imperial cambalac with its palace of the great khan its multitude of crowned barons in silken robes its magic golden flagons its troops of splendid white mares its astrologers leeches conjurers and choruses of girls with cheeks as full as the moon who by their sweet singing please friar odoric ah friar most of all then there was india including sipangu or japan with its rose-coloured pearls and gold abundant beyond all measure india of the twenty-four hundred islands and sixty-four crowned kings india of the ruby the sapphire and the diamond of the malaccas drowsy with perfumes and rich in drugs and spices of the golden temples and the uncouth gods of the eunuchs and the ivory the beasts the serpents and the brilliant birds other tales there were brought by these landsmen the missionaries just as the west had its sea of darkness the atlantic ocean so the east had its land of darkness the extreme northeast of asia a region of mountain and sand of cold and snow where dwelt the gog and magog of ezekiel and to reach this dark land barriers must be overcome defiles fierce with demoniac winds deserts swathed in mystic light and vibrant to jigging tunes valleys awful with dead men's bones moreover as in the west the mythical islands of the dark sea were the abode of creatures beyond the thought of man so in the east the dark land harboured beings quite as preternatural here co-tenants so to speak of gog and magog were the cynocephali or dog-headed creatures the parasitae so narrow-mouthed as to be forced to subsist exclusively on odours jointless hopping creatures who cried chin chin one-eyed creatures midget creatures and what not 
i was told says friar rubruck that there is a province beyond cathay and at whatever age a man enters it that age he keeps which he had on entering which naively exclaims the friar i do not believe odoric had far more hardihood in narrative for speaking of india he notes i heard tell that there be trees which bear men and women like fruit upon them these people are fixed in the tree up to the navel and there they be when the wind blows they be fresh but when it does not blow they are all dried up this i saw not in sooth but i heard it told by people who had seen it as a sceptic among tale-bringers from the east however john of marignoli ranks foremost a paradise on earth still somewhere existing an adam's footprint in ceylon a noah's ark still on ararat such things were verities to him but not so preternatural creatures the truth is he declares that no such people do exist as nations though there may be an individual monster here and there indeed so adventurous in scepticism is john that in some particulars he o'er leaps himself there are he avers no antipodes men having the soles of their feet opposite to ours certainly not he has learned too by sure experience that if the ocean be divided by two lines forming a cross two of the quadrants so resulting are navigable and the two others not navigable at all for god willed not that men should be able to sail round the whole world so far as missionaries were concerned the east might lure them to cathay or even to farthest india through interest in some shadowy prester john an interest largely of a religious nature but it was otherwise with royal envoys and merchants the lure of the east for them was treasure and merchandise in other words wealth as early as eleven sixty five to sixty seven a spanish jew of navarre rabbi benjamin by name who was concerned in trade set forth from tudela his native city and visiting saragossa genoa constantinople tyre damascus baghdad and points in arabia reached the island of kish and the mouth of the persian gulf at the gates of india and within earshot of cathay he was the first modern european it is said to as much as mentioned china nearly a century later twelve fifty four appeared the royal traveller haytham the first king of lesser armenia on a visit to mangu khan at karakorum then in twelve seventy five came marco polo son and nephew of traders bred in the commercial traditions of venice and himself the first european of parts to tell of the splendours of the great khan polo's most interesting successor thirteen twenty five to fifty five was an arab man of the world gay selfish sensuous and observing ibn batuta batuta journeyed deviously from morocco to cathay and india thence he leisurely returned to his native tangier by way of spain and as he strolled he sang of all the four quarters of heaven the best i'll prove it past question is surely the west to these landsmen the envoys and merchants the lure of the east was wealth it was silks silks of gelan taffetas of shiraz yeds and serpe sandals of gran and brown cloth of gold gold brocades silver gauze silks and satins of souchau cramoisi fabrics wrought in beasts birds trees and flowers it was also gold ingots of gold beaten gold gold and silver plate gold pillars and lamps gold coronets and head-dresses gold armlets and anklets gold girdles cinctures censures cups and basins pearls too of beautiful water and gems especially of india made part of this wealth said ibn batuta men at kish descend to the bed of the sea the persian gulf buy ropes and collect shellfish then split them and extract the pearls 
again he said i traversed the bazaar of the jewellers at tabritz and my eyes were dazzled by the variety of precious stones which i beheld handsome slaves superbly dressed and girdled with silk offered their gems for sale to the tartar ladies who bought great numbers but of all this wealth so luring in the fact so alluring in the recital the chief items were aromatics and spices sandalwood aloewood spikenard frankincense civet and musk rhubarb nutmegs mace cloves ginger pepper and cinnamon and of spices one stood pre-eminent pepper rabbi benjamin was of his time when he said that two parasangs from the sea of sodom is the pillar of salt into which lot's wife was turned but he was for subsequent times as well when he described the pearls and pepper to the heat of pepper land malabar a persian ambassador to india once bore witness in the statement that so intense was this heat that it burned the ruby in the mine and the marrow in the bones to say naught of melting the sword in the scabbard like wax but this by the way pepper it was the spice which in ancient days had formed part of the ransom of rome from alaric that throughout the middle ages and far into the fifteenth century constituted in europe the commodity most prized and talked of for it was the one most costly the one closest to gold in intrinsic worth prior to fourteen ninety two then the romanticism of the spaniard as of other europeans was stirred by tales of the west and tales of the east tales by seamen and tales by landsmen and these in the main were circulated by word of mouth furthermore so potent were these stories that even when ascribed to mere weavers of dreams they would not be denied and could not be ignored and in the minds of two or three persons they begat the old question of aristotle might not the ocean sea which bordered cathay and held sipangu be one with the sea of darkness which lay west of europe and held antilia End of chapter one chapter two part one of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain columbus and new lands for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars it may be we shall touch the happy isles tennyson ulysses among the sojourners in spain prior to fourteen ninety two there was a genoese by name christopher columbus he was tall and well built of dignified mien with red hair and beard a long ruddy face clear gray eyes and aquiline nose to inferiors his manner was exacting and brusque to equals it was urbane and to superiors it was courtly his figure showed to advantage whereof he was not unduly aware and he evinced a taste for yellow in beads and for crimson and scarlet in caps cloaks and shoes unlike the spaniards whom he was to lead columbus was not in disposition primitive he had no relish for blood and suffering he was however proud with a measure of austerity and he was highly romantic and strikingly devout his most signal powers and they were signal indeed were moral powers in patience endurance tenacity energy will powers which far more than those distinctively intellectual make for greatness the world has rarely known his equal imagination too he possessed rich and ardent and it rendered him poetic eloquent and persuasive but just as he possessed the qualities named so likewise he possessed the defects of them 
he was masterful and imaginative but his masterfulness tended to ungenerousness and his imagination to vagary and mischievous exaggeration nor was this all his moral powers were largely determined in exercise by two positive principles of action which were undeniably sinister vanity and cupidity and under stress of these he became at times dissimulating boastful and crafty it is probable however that the sinister in him has by recent writers been somewhat over magnified throughout everything he was sincerely and enthusiastically religious to him as to others of machiavellian strain the end justified many means but not all though among the justified means were those of guile according to the findings of the most recent scholarship christopher columbus the eldest in a family of four sons and one daughter was born at genoa on a date between august twenty six and october thirty one fourteen fifty one his grandfather probably and his father certainly was a wool dealer and weaver and the latter at one time also conducted a wine shop none of his progenitors had place or rank and his sister married a cheesemonger there were other persons in europe in his time of the sobriquet columbus one of whom william of casseneuve was a corsair and vice-admiral of france under louis eleven and with these christopher columbus about fifteen hundred and one sought to indicate relationship by the remark that he was not the first admiral in his family but the claim so far as can be ascertained was wanting in foundation the education of christopher was of the most elementary sort it consisted merely of what was provided by a school maintained by the weavers guild of the town of his birth in a little street called pavia lane how meagre his first advantages were appears in the fact that at no time in life did he assume to write his mother tongue italian not even when addressing the bank of st george in genoa we have seen that as a man columbus was both vigorous of body and imaginative of mind for him therefore as a lad in genoa the genoa of our travellers rabbi benjamin marco polo and ibn battuta to develop a taste for the sea was more natural than not in fact he tells us that from his fourteenth year he was accustomed to embark on ships but in fourteen seventy two when he was twenty-one years old he declared before a notary that he was by trade a weaver we may suppose then that up to this period his seafaring was tentative or in the nature of a youth's adventures thereafter it became more and more an occupation in genoa at this time dwelt two noblemen with whom columbus seems to have been on terms of friendship he went with them in fourteen seventy five to the island of chios in the aegean where he obtained a shipment of malmsey wine and became familiar with mastic in fourteen seventy six the two noblemen embarked on a voyage to england and again columbus accompanied them in a flotilla for it was a voyage of importance which consisted of five armed merchantmen when they were off cape st vincent who should appear but the corsair and french vice-admiral william of casseneuve alias columbus between the genoese vessels and those of louis eleven there straightway ensued a desperate struggle in the end ships on both sides took fire and the crews leaped overboard columbus of genoa the future discoverer leaped with others and being fortunate enough to be picked up was landed on the portuguese coast near lisbon wounded drenched and exhausted such in august fourteen seventy six was the advent of columbus in portugal an advent certainly fortuitous if not miraculous as he terms it from lisbon columbus continued in december his interrupted voyage to england stopping probably at bristol and it would seem that he even adventured into the seas toward iceland 
i sailed he says as quoted by his son ferdinand in the month of february fourteen seventy seven a hundred leagues beyond the island of thule iceland at some period prior to fifteen hundred and three the discoverer had read the latin poet seneca and found the lines in later ages a time shall come when the ocean shall relax its chains when typhus shall disclose new lands and thule shall no longer be earth's bound now columbus took typhus the pilot as his own prototype and to make the identification more complete he may have deemed it well that the discoverer of america should as a preliminary have fared beyond thule in the career of columbus portugal was the first turning-point hither he returned in fourteen seventy seven or fourteen seventy eight and here in fourteen seventy nine or fourteen eighty after a trip back to genoa he married this event was the reward of his piety in lisbon there was a convent of the religious order of st jacques called the convent of saints its protégés were bound to vows of chastity conjugal chastity not celibacy and among them was philippa a daughter of two of the noblest of portuguese houses and philippa was beautiful coming daily to the chapel of this convent to make his devotions columbus saw philippa fell in love with her and they were wed to the couple in fourteen eighty or fourteen eighty one a child was born columbus's first son diego at this period too columbus became associated in lisbon with his younger brother bartholomew a prepossessing youth of about nineteen astute of some education and skilled in the art of limbing marine charts the father of philippa columbus was bartholomew perestrello governor of porto santo of the madeira group and it is a firm tradition that at his death in fourteen fifty seven he left to his wife isabel philippa's mother charts and papers which served first to direct columbus's mind toward great projects in the west another tradition long credited then long discredited and now revived was that columbus upon his marriage settled in the island of madeira which is near to that of porto santo and that while he was here a spanish ship which had been driven westward to the island afterwards found by columbus and named espanola came forlornly back getting as far only as madeira here so the tradition ran the pilot of the ship together with such of the crew as survived debarked but the crew famished and sick all died leaving only the pilot then he too died in the house of columbus but not before he had imparted to his host the amazing story of his voyage and had given to him his log and a chart of his route be the truth of these two traditions what it may it is a well-settled fact that in portugal columbus met pilots and captains and was enabled to accompany portuguese expeditions down the coast of africa i was he says at the fortress of st george of the mine belonging to the king of portugal which lies below the equinoctial line the object of such voyages was largely the discovery of new islands the canaries and the madeiras the outermost of the azores and the cape verde group all were treasure trove of the fifteenth century and there might well be others in these times indeed islands rose smiling to greet the discoverer on his approach nay more where actual islands were not forthcoming imaginary ones developed in their stead but were these isles as mythical and imaginary as they were represented the question is pertinent for upon the answer depends in good measure what we shall think of the nature of the incentive which underlay the voyage of fourteen ninety two the voyage resulting in the discovery of america the very appearance of islands like antilia salvaggio Rayella and insula in mar on charts such for example as the bacaria of fourteen thirty five attest the prevalence of a tradition and that a mature one that such a group existed such a tradition could probably have had but one origin 
chance voyages across the atlantic from europe to north america and especially to the west india islands of north america indeed in fourteen seventy four or fourteen seventy five fernayo tellius sought the mythical antilia sometimes called the isle of the seven cities under express warrant from the king of portugal alfonso v and in his journal of fourteen ninety two columbus records that many honourable spanish gentlemen of the canary group declared that every year they saw land to the west of the canaries again he records that in fourteen eighty four when he was in portugal a man dominguez do arco came to the king john the second from the island of madeira to beg for a caravel to go to this island that was seen and that the same thing the existence of an island in the west was affirmed in the azores how therefore there might arise a story true or false of a shipwrecked pilot who gave to columbus the clue to the finding of the island of espanola may readily be perceived but concerning stories of and by pilots more anon columbus had now acquired some knowledge of the theory and art of navigation and incidentally some knowledge of latin and having made up his mind and as had tellies before him that in the atlantic to the west there yet remained islands and lands to be discovered he obtained an audience with the king of portugal and laid before him a definite proposal he asked for three caravels equipped and supplied for a year and in the event of lands being found for the viceroyalty and perpetual government therein a tenth of the income therefrom the rank of nobleman and the title of grand admiral according to portuguese chroniclers writing in the sixteenth century the particular land columbus had in view was simpangu or japan but whatever columbus may have disclosed or reserved with respect to japan or with respect to antilia at this first interview with the portuguese king so affronted was the monarch by what he felt to be the vanity and presumption of the petitioner that he promptly referred his plea to a council of three experts by whom after some deliberation it was dismissed thereupon columbus late in fourteen eighty five or early in fourteen eighty six left portugal for spain at this point in the fortunes of christopher columbus there arises for consideration a peculiar circumstance columbus had a double the well-known cosmographer of nuremberg martin Behaim like columbus this man was born near the middle of the fifteenth century like him he lacked university training like him his early activities were commercial like him he settled in portugal fourteen eighty to eighty four like him he voyaged to africa like him he was identified with an atlantic island Fayal, in his case and married the daughter of the governor like him he was busied with nautical studies in lisbon like him he was not highly regardful of veracity and finally like him he died in neglect early in the sixteenth century Bahaim, however unlike columbus was of patrician ancestry was instructed in the use of nautical instruments became a knight of portugal and at lisbon had the entree to aristocratic and scientific circles the extent of his geographical knowledge may be inferred from a globe which he completed at nuremberg in fourteen ninety two before the return of columbus from his first voyage his authorities included aristotle and strabo ptolemy marcus polo and sir john mandeville but his chief authority was pierre dailly whose imago mundi world survey written in fourteen ten formed a compendium of the geographical and cosmographical notions of authors such as marinus of tyre and afragonus the arabian to put the matter briefly 
the ideas of pierre dailly and marco polo are strikingly expressed in this globe which shows cathay and india both marked rich opposite to portugal and africa and about a hundred and twenty degrees west of the cape verde islands and the azores instead of the actual distance of over two hundred degrees cathay is thus brought forward nearly to the position of california cipango cipangu or japan marked as especially rich falls athwart the position of mexico while antilia lies northeast of the position of haiti or espanola and st brandon occupies in part the position of northern south america but why did bahaim take pains to construct a globe the answer is clear he had recently fourteen eighty six adventured in a project to confirm his geographical ideas he had attempted a secret voyage westward to asia in partnership with two fellow-islanders fernam dulmo of terceira a navigator and yawo alfonso estrito of madeira his patron the enterprise had failed and yet he did not wish his ideas to be lost or appropriated by another concerning columbus however the important question is was he indebted to bahaim for his own ideas of cosmography for the idea especially of a small earth it would hardly seem so the two men may have met in portugal but even if they had each at the time was guarding a secret or the approaches to one columbus that of islands perchance of a specific island to be discovered and bahaim that of a scheme for exploiting asia that not very much confidential communication between them was likely under the circumstances may be conjectured columbus according to his own statement entered spain after fourteen years spent in vain labours in portugal as a matter of fact his stay there did not at the utmost exceed ten years probably only five or six he came accompanied by his son diego for felipa beautiful daughter of the convent of saints had probably died soon after diego's birth furthermore he quitted portugal for what reason may never be known secretly at night in spain columbus's first objective was palos here at the monastery of la ribida whose guardian antonio de marchena the future discoverer is said to have known in portugal he found lodgings for himself and a temporary home for his son the supposition is that at palos which as a seaport was the resort of mariners and where there were many portuguese columbus counted upon obtaining special information with regard to the landfall of some particular early voyage or voyages into the west but if palos was columbus's first objective in spain his second was the court of the spanish sovereigns ferdinand and isabella to these personages columbus worked his way so to speak by the influence of the duke of medina sile who had wealth and who at first contemplated assuming in the schemes of columbus a role not unlike that of estrito in the project of bahaim but coming to realize that the affair was one to be accomplished successfully only under royal patronage the duke applied to the sovereigns who commanded that columbus himself be sent to court cordova now for some time had been the seat of government and here columbus arrived on january twenty fourteen eighty six the sovereigns were then absent but returned at the end of april or first of may and the coveted audience took place what occurred is not known presumably ferdinand and isabella after a courteous hearing smilingly put by the question of exploration for they referred it to the queen's confessor hernando de talavera an ecclesiastic by no means ungenerous or bigoted with instructions to summon a council for its consideration as for the council not a soul who was a member ever revealed aught of its composition or doings save dr rodrigo de maldonado who says that men of science and mariners were in attendance no less than literary men and theologues and that columbus himself was subjected to interrogation 
talavera's council conferred at intervals for five years often at salamanca and at length late in fourteen ninety reported adversely for columbus and the sovereigns accepted the report in the life of the great italian adventurer our future discoverer and admiral these five years are among the most interesting and significant they mark it is true a moral and material decline but like the first years in portugal they mark an intellectual advance while awaiting action by the council columbus was retained at court and encouraged by occasional donations of money donations appearing on record as made to a stranger occupied with certain affairs relative to the service of their highnesses the sums in all came to five hundred and ten dollars one hundred and seventy thousand maravedis but small as they were they had altogether ceased by fourteen eighty eight in that year it was or at the end of fourteen eighty seven the preceding year that columbus for a second time fell victim to feminine attractions the maiden like his first bride philippa was young eighteen or twenty years old possessed a beautiful name beatrix enriquez and doubtless a beautiful person but unlike philippa she was humble of birth and very poor so lowly indeed was she that columbus did not stoop to take her in marriage but formed with her a liaison the result of which was the birth about august fifteen fourteen eighty eight of his second son and future biographer ferdinand between the date just given and the spring of fourteen eighty nine columbus would seem to have gone back to portugal under a safe conduct from john the second but why he went if he did go is unknown and by may twelfth fourteen eighty nine he was again in spain and in attendance upon ferdinand and isabella at the siege of baza thenceforth however until the final rejection of his project by the sovereigns in fourteen ninety he drops from view excepting as we are accorded glimpses of him gaining bread for himself and beatrix in cordova by limbing marine charts wherein he evidently had been instructed by his brother bartholomew and by selling printed books the vending of printed books may have meant much in that intellectual advance which has been spoken of as characterizing for the discoverer to be the days sombre or hectic through which he was now passing some years before his brother had fallen on hard times bartholomew columbus had betaken himself from portugal where he had witnessed the return of the great portuguese captain bartholomew diaz from his discovery of the cape of good hope to enlist the aid of king henry the seventh of england in his brother christopher's project then abandoning england he had recourse in turn to france and now was making himself agreeable at the court of charles the eighth thither columbus determined to follow him but his departure was prevented by a visit which he paid to palos to the monastery of la rabida to make further arrangements for the care of his son diego this visit unlike the first does not seem to have been inspired by a specific wish for light upon voyages with strange landfalls under strange pilots columbus was poverty-stricken and for once discouraged with what cheer he might he met his friend the former guardian antonio de marchina and also perhaps for the first time the officiating guardian juan perez once confessor to queen isabella by these three under the stimulating zeal of the monks a plan was contrived columbus should thoroughly canvass the maritime section having palace for a centre for all possible information regarding pioneer voyages into the sea of darkness the first seaman to be sought out and catechized was pedro de velasco a pilot of palace himself next after velasco an unnamed pilot of the port of santa maria near cadiz was visited he had sailed west from ireland and had he thought sighted the coasts of tartary not improbably labrador finally a second pilot domiciled in palace 
pedro vasquez de la frontera was waited upon it what was gathered from him was suggestive indeed between fourteen sixty and fourteen seventy five he had made a voyage into the west with a prince of portugal to discover new lands their purpose was to sail straight west but encountering that vast field of marine herbage known as the sargasso sea he had turned back at this time in palace the most important man of maritime affairs was the head of the family of pinzon martin alonso best known and bravest of captains and pilots and to him columbus would first have addressed himself had not this mariner been absent with a cargo of sardines at rome as it was columbus awaited his return eagerly pinzon as it chanced was at this juncture cherishing a project of his own for exploring to the west and while in rome had sought light at the library of pope innocent the eighth upon lands in the ocean sea there he had seen a map and a book both of which in the form of copies no doubt he had brought with him these documents according to pinzon's son pinzon the father not only submitted to columbus but gave into his hands furthermore pinzon and columbus now went together to the house of pedro vasquez de la frontera and got him to repeat the tale of how with a prince of portugal he had sailed west as far as the sargasso sea from before which he had recoiled it was necessary to brave this obstacle said vasquez because by not doing so the prince had failed to find land if on meeting the sargasso sea one would but keep straight on it would be impossible that land should not be found how on his voyage in fourteen ninety two columbus made use of a chart whereon he himself had depicted certain islands how this chart was passed back and forth between him and martin alonso pinzon and how apropos of the impending landfall one of the pilots spoke to columbus of indications from your book are incidents well known nor is it less well known that on this voyage after encountering the sargasso sea columbus despite protest braved the obstacle and kept straight on literally on and on following as nearly as he could the twenty-eighth parallel till land rewarded his perseverance not long after the return of martin alonso panzon from rome guardian juan perez and perhaps pinzon also wrote to queen isabella asking a further hearing for columbus and his project the request was granted and perez was summoned to court at santa fe before granada he set out in a manner truly colombian alone on a mule secretly at low midnight he was soon empowered to invite columbus to join him in december the latter came ferdinand and isabella were in receptive mood granada was about to fall and spain to be delivered from the moor for ever a council was ordered one like talavera's composed of philosophers astrologers cosmographers seamen and pilots with talavera's council however the primary consideration had been the theoretical feasibility of columbus's project with the new council it was the practical question of ways and means that gave pause columbus repeating with emphasis the terms submitted to king john the second of portugal demanded of ferdinand and isabella a patent of nobility the admiralty of the ocean the viceroyalty and government of all lands discovered and a commission of ten per cent upon everything within the limits of his admiralty which might be bought exchanged found or gained that in addition he should demand three caravels to cost possibly two million maravedis six thousand dollars was by comparison trifling in after years the discoverer of america was wont to complain that in his struggle for recognition in spain everybody had derided him save two monks marchena and perez 
derided he no doubt was but the cause perhaps was not so much his belief in problematical islands and lands as his demand for rewards rewards which if granted would raise him to a dizzy height to a point of rank power and riches next to that of the throne itself as in fourteen eighty six so in fourteen ninety two in the month of january to which we are now come columbus was dismissed a second time from the spanish court and departed sorrowing the royal flag streamed from the towers of the alhambra for granada had fallen but in this event our genoese took little interest his course led him toward cordova for here was beatrix enriquez with ferdinand now in his fourth year and here must now be brought diego ten or twelve years old from la rabida again it must have been france his last hope among the nations with which the thoughts of columbus were busy be that as it may when but two leagues from granada who should overtake him but a royal constable sent post-haste by the queen with orders for his return his demands one and all would be complied with what specifically it was that induced the spanish sovereigns to change their minds may be only inferred whether it was proof of actual islands to the west proof secretly confided to columbus at palos no one knows whatever it was the lost cause was powerfully pleaded before isabella by luis de santangel treasurer of aragon and before ferdinand by juan cabrera his chamberlain and by juan diego of deza preceptor of to prince john the risk was small the possibilities for god and the realm were incalculable such we are told was the reasoning especially was it the reasoning of st angel and so wrought upon by it was isabella that seized with enthusiasm she is said to have tendered her jewels priceless gems that they were in security for money for the enterprise what manner of navigator was this genoese this christopher columbus by whom this vast enterprise had been conceived and by whom it was to be carried out he was indeed no stranger to the sea for he had been to chios in the east to africa in the south and to england in the north to use his own words i have traversed the sea for twenty-three years without leaving it for any time worth counting and i saw all the levant and the west azores etc and the north which is the way to england and i have been to guinea in nautical skill the scientific feature of seafaring columbus according to the most competent opinion was however little advanced he claimed that on his guinea trips he had verified alfraganus's calculation of the length of a degree on the equator at fifty-six and two-thirds italian miles but aside from the fact that at the period of these trips fourteen eighty two to eighty four he could hardly have known of alfraganus or his calculation for he then presumably knew nothing of the imago mundi of pierre d'ailly a book possibly not then even published there remains the further fact that verification was a process quite too complex for any means at his disposal his claim therefore tends only to prove him guilty of what a stanch admirer does not hesitate to characterize as insufferable braggadocio but daunted as little by the obstacle of ignorance as by other obstacles the would-be discoverer held unflinchingly to his role and when all was over and the triumph won could bring himself to say i had from our lord a spirit of intelligence in regard to navigation he made me very intelligent of astrology he gave me what was sufficient and also of geometry and arithmetic he gave me an ingenious mind and hands apt in designing this sphere and upon it the cities mountains and the rivers the islands and harbours all in their proper place in this time i saw and studied diligently all the books of cosmography history and of philosophy and of 
other sciences yet for all this confidence if the voyage of fourteen ninety two had depended on the technical knowledge of columbus its history would be brief indeed had it not been for martin alonso pinzon it would never have been made in that year pinzon we may recall was in fourteen ninety two the chief citizen of palos after the spanish sovereigns had decided to sanction and subvention the colombian undertaking they gave decree that of the three caravels required two should be furnished by the town of palos in discharge of a feudal liability to the crown and columbus on the twelfth of may set out from granada to make sure of the vessels the pending expedition was unpopular in itself and still more unpopular in that its admiral was a foreigner but at length columbus obtained the three caravels the pinta the nina and the santa maria capitania so far well or fairly well and then a balk the seamen of palos unanimously and persistently refused to embark to them the project was perilous chimerical and vain a subject of derision columbus had papers for the impressment of criminals but to escape this necessity he went to pinzon who supplied the sailors on being assured of some share in the enterprise End of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain columbus and new lands in respect to size rig and equipment the three colombian caravels were nearly the same the santa maria which was slightly the largest measured about eighty feet in length twenty-five feet in breadth and fifteen feet in depth and had a capacity of over two hundred tons all were fully decked had three masts and except upon the mizzen were square rigged the santa maria and pinta had each a high poop deck and forecastle but the nina reputed the smallest of the three had neither all were good sailors making as a flotilla an average speed of fifteen italian miles an hour and each had something of an armament the personnel of the expedition comprised some ninety seamen and thirty royal officials servants domestics and cabin boys but no friar or ecclesiastic was listed in supreme command of the expedition was columbus himself on the santa maria and in command of the santa maria was her owner the cosmographer juan de la cosa this vessel carried also two pilots a grand constable a physician an archivist and an interpreter versed in several tongues the pinta was commanded by martin alonso pinzon and one of its two pilots was martin's brother francisco while as commander of the nina sailed vincente yanez pinzon youngest brother of martin alonso and one of the two future discoverers of subquatorial south america the pilot was the owner pero alonso nino columbus set sail from palos on august three fourteen ninety two at sunrise first however he had arranged for sending his young son diego to cordova to be cared for by beatrix enriquez with whom was his younger son ferdinand first also supremely first he had made confession and solemnly received the sacrament as his ships cleared the bar of saltees and gathered headway naught but inspiring could have been the spectacle the high prows the huge square sails each emblazoned with its cross the magnificent sweep of the rakish latines athwart the towering sterns the flags and streamers the officers crowding the poop decks the sailors thronging the forecastles and crows nests all saluting many praying some no doubt weeping all crying adios how tremendous it all was how much it meant 
as a mere feat of seamanship however this first recorded voyage across the atlantic was not considerable the flotilla left the canary island of gomera on september sixth fourteen ninety two and shaped a course westward the winds blew steadily astern no storms arose the resources of navigation were in no wise taxed indeed on the sixteenth of september and often afterwards columbus notes that they met with very temperate breezes so that there was great pleasure in enjoying the mornings nothing being wanted but the song of nightingales the weather he says was like april in andalusia apprehension nevertheless did not sleep it lurked already solemn teneriffe had raised above them in greeting mayhap in warning its staff of fire the needle victim perchance of subtle necromancy had begun straying from the pole grass first in green tufts then in fine masses then in tangles and skeins with crabs enmeshed that grass before which a prince of portugal had once turned back was all about them yea slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea and those winds so balmy but so faithfully setting into the unknown west was it not all a snare of unseen powers there were murmurs plots it is said to seize the admiral unawares and hurl him overboard columbus on his part laughed at the fears of the sailors and made them big offers of wealth had he not the whole of cathay before him that in his mind columbus had asia the country of the great khan as in some sort of a destination cannot well be gainsaid if we are prepared to yield any substantial credence to his journal as we have it according to that document he was expecting as early as the sixteenth of september to come upon islands but made the mainland to be more distant and thought it better to go at once to the continent and afterwards to the islands but of the events of this voyage his though it was columbus was not sole arbiter martin alonso pinzon by circumstances and also perhaps by agreement was an associate and in his mind evidently the destination was simpangu or japan as will be recalled he had brought from rome a chart and a book both of which he had handed to columbus now in the book was this sentence in navigating by the mediterranean sea to the end of spain and thence in the direction where the sun sinks between the north and the south you will find a land of simpanso simpangu which is so fertile and so rich that by aid of its resources you will be able to subjugate both africa and europe furthermore inspired by the book and also by marco polo pinzon in a recruiting appeal to the seamen of pallas had said friends come with us come with us on this voyage here you are in poverty come with us for according to accounts you will find the houses with roofs of gold and you will return rich and prosperous when therefore on the twenty fifth of september martin alonso called columbus's attention to the fact that according to a chart which both were using the flotilla ought to be sighting certain islands we were not surprised for it was islands or at least the island of japan and not a mainland in which the interests of pinzon centred and when on the seventh of october columbus in deference to the wish of pinzon actually changed direction from west to west southwest and when on the twelfth land guanahani or watling island rewarded the change it was natural that both columbus and pinzon should be convinced that they were in an archipelago of asiatic india with japan not far away the expedition now had traversed one thousand one hundred and twenty three leagues or four thousand four hundred and ninety two italian miles from the canaries and yet as ferdinand columbus informs us seven hundred or seven hundred and fifty leagues three thousand miles was the distance at which the admiral had told his men that he expected to find land if this land was the antilia salvaggio reella group west indies or antilles as seems probable it is represented on 
the himes globe through a composite antilia as from two thousand two hundred to two thousand five hundred miles west from the canaries and it was at about this distance on and near the twenty fifth of september that both columbus and pinzon began anxiously scanning the horizon the fact that three thousand miles was given out by columbus as the distance to be covered before land might be looked for may be explained by his wish to mislead his crews into the belief that they were committed to a longer unbroken voyage than they really were he in fact states repeatedly in his journal that he kept a dual reckoning one of actual distances for himself and one of minimized distances for his men how he could have contrived to do this with half a dozen pilots and a score or more of others at his elbow more competent at rating a ship's progress than himself goodness as lord dunraven puts it only knows a landfall in the case of any fifteenth-century voyage of discovery was momentous but especially was it so in the case of a spanish voyage commanders fell on their knees and gave thanks crews chanted the gloria in excelsis deo and crowded into the rigging and tops flags were run up and guns were fired so was it at guanahani on october twelfth fourteen ninety two clad in armor over which true to his taste in color and to his instinct for effect he had thrown the crimson robe of an admiral of castile columbus with the furled royal standard grasped in his left hand bent low to the earth which he saluted his actions were imitated by the captains of the pinta and nina martin alonzo pinzon and his brother vincente yahoo bore standards emblazoned each with a green cross then rising columbus summoned to him the royal notary and the royal inspector as witnesses unfurled the royal standard drew his sword and proclaimed the island the possession henceforth of the crown of spain naming it san salvador so the day ended but early the next morning as we are told the natives gathered on the shore in large numbers and destitute of beards themselves looked with wonder on the bearded spaniards on columbus in particular to his beard and those of his men they reached out their fingers and viewed attentively the whiteness of the spanish hands and faces on the twenty eighth of october the expedition discovered cuba and on the fifth of december haiti or espanola everywhere columbus was charmed with the scenery the herbage is like that of april in andalusia andalusia serves always as the standard of comparison so pleasant are the songs of birds that it seems as though a man could never wish to leave the place parrots rise in flocks so dense as to conceal the sun in cuba are palm trees differing from those in spain and guinea as for the inhabitants of the new regions they are docile very gentle and kind going naked without arms and without law but the things which make a particular appeal to the discoverer are five gold religion spices simpangu and cathay gold he began inquiring about from the natives on the day following the landing i was attentive and took trouble to ascertain he says if there was gold but gold in the journal is a theme hardly more emphasized than religion on the very day of the landing columbus writes i believe that they the natives would easily be made christians as it appeared to me they had no sect he was equally attentive to any mention of spices according as i obtain tidings of gold or spices i shall settle what must be done moreover it is in connection with spices that the journal introduces simpangu and cathay having on the seventh of october given over the search for the mainland columbus on the twenty first speaks of proceeding to simpangu which he identifies with cuba because of the latter's size and riches 
it is better he says to inspect much land until some very profitable country is reached my belief being that it will be rich in spices and on the twenty fourth he resumes on the spheres that i saw before leaving spain and on the paintings of world maps sipangu is in this region then on the twenty sixth of october the subject is dropped with the remark i departed for cuba for by the signs the indians made of its greatness and of its gold and pearls i thought that it must be the one that is to say sipangu but the mainland recurs in his thoughts and on the thirtieth he decides from a statement by the indians that cuba itself is the mainland of asia with cathay and the great khan somewhere therein and that he must send to the latter the credentials he bears from ferdinand and isabella accordingly on the second of november he dispatches from a point on the cuban coast his official interpreter luis de torres a converted jew with a party carrying specimens of spices to ask for the king of that land to him they are to deliver the credentials and from him they are to inquire concerning certain provinces ports and rivers of which the admiral has notice later columbus identifies sipangu with haiti but cuba he consistently continued to regard as the mainland peering expectantly into its bays and up its streams for populous cities such as the kinsay of marco polo and of the world maps maps like fra moros of fourteen fifty seven to fifty nine which he saw before leaving spain having completed his voyage by finding what he sought though manifestly not populous cities columbus set sail from the eastern end of the island of haiti for home on january sixteen fourteen ninety three two occurrences hastened his return on november twenty one fourteen ninety two martin alonso pinzon impatient for the discovery of sipangu and the realization of those dreams of gold on the strength of which he had secured enlistments at palace had gone off in the pinta for some prospecting of his own then on christmas night the santa maria had been wrecked leaving the admiral with only the nina wherein to continue his explorations thus handicapped he had been forced to build on espanola haiti a fortress la navidad where he left thirty-seven of his men and crowded into the nina the remainder pinzon had rejoined the expedition on january sixth fourteen ninety three but the admiral was much vexed and not disposed to parley or linger nor is his vexation hard to understand columbus was the titular and technical head of the expedition but in reality he was much the servant of his lieutenant for pinzon was a spaniard the friend and fellow-townsman of the crews who would not have endured to see him disciplined in strong contrast to the voyage out the voyage back was tempestuous storms began on the twelfth of february and so grew in violence that on the fourteenth columbus placed in a barrel a parchment inscribed with an account of his discoveries and committed it to the sea but he succeeded in making port in the portuguese island of santa maria one of the azores whence he sailed for castile more storms delayed him but on the fourth of march the nina entered the tagus and anchored off restello of the fate of the pinta meanwhile nothing had been known since the fourteenth of february when she had disappeared running before the wind once at anchor and once having satisfied the portuguese authorities that he was a duly accredited officer of the spanish marine columbus was hospitably received granted supplies and invited by king john the second the same with whom he had held memorable converse in fourteen eighty three or fourteen eighty four to visit him at valparaiso near lisbon columbus went with some trepidation and according to portuguese accounts told the king that he had come from the discovery of the islands of sipangu and antilia but made no mention of cathay and the great khan or of india o man of miserable understanding the king is said 
by spaniards to have exclaimed at the interview smiting his breast why didst thou let an undertaking of such great importance go out of thine hands by the fifteenth of march the admiral was at palace where on the evening of the same day martin alonzo pinzon likewise arrived having brought the pinta safe into port at bayona in galicia but it was a full month before columbus was received by ferdinand and isabella in barcelona and in the meantime pinzon already ill when he disembarked had breathed his last what light upon the great voyage to the antilles might have been shed had pin's own forceful personality that he was survived in sevilla where amid much ovation columbus awaited the pleasure of the spanish sovereigns there came to him a letter dated the thirtieth of march addressed to the admiral of the ocean sea and viceroy and governor of the islands discovered in the indies and confirming what had previously been conditionally granted to him in the capitulation and letters patent of april fourteen ninety two if the welcome to the admiral at sevilla had been noteworthy that which he was accorded at barcelona was more noteworthy still throngs attended him and his bodyguard was the best chivalry of spain in advance marched a group of some half-dozen new world indians and a squad of sailors from the nina the indians wore gold armaments and carried spears and arrows while the sailors bore aloft forty parrots of gorgeous plumage besides other birds together with rare plants and animals among which not the least was an iguana five feet long its back bristling with spines ferdinand and isabella happy at the success of their adventurous protege which no doubt they had scarcely expected were augustly gracious seated under a golden canopy in the alcazar of the moorish kings they rose to greet columbus on his entry gently deprecated his lowliness in stooping to kiss their hands and made him sit at their feet so placed the discoverer of america a master of speech told his tale illustrating it with the indians the sailors the specimens and the gold the monarchs and court then said a prayer the choir of the royal chapel chanted te deum and the ceremony closed the news of the return of columbus soon spread and evoked ingenious appraisals among the learned in the month of august last as hannibal juanarius an italian gentleman from barcelona wrote to his brother in fourteen ninety three this great king ferdinand at the prayer of one named columba caused four sick little vessels to be equipped to navigate upon the ocean in a straight line toward the west until finally the east was reached the earth being round he should certainly arrive in the eastern regions also from barcelona on the fourteenth of may peter martyr the horace walpole of his day wrote to his friend count tendilla a few days after an attempted assassination of king ferdinand there returned from the western antipodes a certain christopher columbus a ligurian who with barely three ships penetrated to the province which was believed to be fabulous he returned bearing substantial proofs in the shape of many precious things and particularly of gold again on the first of october this time from milan martyr wrote to the archbishop of braga a certain columbus has sailed to the western antipodes even as he believes to the very shores of india he has discovered many islands beyond the eastern ocean adjoining the indies which are believed to be those of which mention has been made among cosmographers i do not wholly deny this although the magnitude of the globe seems to suggest otherwise for there are not wanting those who think it but a small journey from the end of spain to the shores of india finally on january thirty one fourteen ninety four our letter-writer addresses these words to the archbishop of granada the king and queen at barcelona have created an admiral of the ocean sea columbus returned from his most honorable charge and they have admitted him to sit in their presence which is as you know a supreme proof of benevolence and honor with our sovereigns 
but anticipating rumours reports and letters columbus himself had had a word to say respecting his voyage writing from shipboard on february fifteenth fourteen ninety three to luis de saint angel his stanch advocate was isabella he had declared when i reached juana cuba i followed its coast westwardly and found it so large that i thought it might be the mainland province of cathay as a matter of fact however interest in this exploit on the part of columbus attached itself less to the geographical discoveries than to the preternatural creatures that lurked on the margins of the earth hannibal juan nuarius our italian acquaintance of epistolary bent remarked to his brother apropos of the genoese navigator that the earth being round the latter should certainly arrive in the eastern regions but forgetful near the end of his letter of the scientific aspects of the great voyage juanuarius wrote he columbus adds that he has lately been in a country where men are born with tails nor was the soft impeachment wholly inaccurate for in his own shipboard letter to st angel the admiral said there remains for me on the western side of cuba two provinces whereto i did not go one of which they call anan where the people are born with tails and in his journal columbus had already noted that far away there were as he understood men with one eye and others with dogs noses who were cannibals but he was wary in statement for in the st angel letter he concluded the subject by remarking that down to the present he had not found in those islands the antilles any monstrous men as many expected with regard to mermaids it was different these the admiral had himself seen both on the coast of guinea and in the antilles the antillean sirens as he had seen them were three in number they rose well out of the sea but were not so beautiful as painted though having to some extent the human face and columbus believed in amazons he had never beheld any but had been told they lived in the island of martinino martinique and he had meant to stop there on his way home to secure a few to exhibit along with his indians to ferdinand and isabella his half dozen indians his forty gorgeous parrots his spine iguana and his gold of the latter not more than enough to whet a royal appetite together with stories about mermaids and natives who burnt a queer herb tobaccos were about all in the way of wonders ocular or auricular that columbus had brought home with him the great thing the super epoch making thing though not yet understood so to be was the voyage itself the voyage itself and the will to make it this too largely irrespective of whether the objective was in some sort asia or simply a barataria an island to govern besides the voyage of fourteen ninety two columbus made three other voyages on the second which lasted from september fourteen ninety three to march fourteen ninety six and was undertaken with seventeen ships and fifteen hundred men including his brother diego he discovered puerto rico and jamaica learned that his colony of fourteen ninety two at la navidad had been totally destroyed and found it in its stead in espanola haiti the ambitious settlement of isabella he also visited cuba and compelled his entire ship's company to make oath that they believed it to be the mainland the alpha or beginning of the indies the third voyage of columbus from january fourteen ninety eight to october fifteen hundred was undertaken with six ships and two hundred men to test the opinion of king john the second of portugal that to the south there lay a continent and the opinion was sustained for the voyage was signalized by the admiral's greatest achievement next to that of fourteen ninety two the discovery of the mainland of america at pariah near the mouths of the orinoco mistaking the land at first for an insular body he soon came to realize its true character as early as july fourteen ninety eight he wrote it is certain that the discovery of this land in this place is as great a miracle as the discovery on the first voyage and in august he thus confided to his journal i am convinced that this is the mainland and very large of which no knowledge has been had until now 
later in october when writing to ferdinand and isabella he said i think that if the river mentioned the orinoco does not proceed from the terrestrial paradise it comes from an immense tract of land in the south of which no knowledge has been hitherto obtained but meanwhile in espanola conditions social and political and economical had become chaotic and in fifteen hundred the admiral was superseded as governor by francisco de babadilla who stretching his authority arrested his predecessor together with his brother bartholomew and his brother diego and sent them to spain in fetters promptly released by the sovereigns columbus after an affecting and on his part we may be sure eloquent scene with isabella was released with the promise of a restoration of his privileges as defined in the capitulation and letters patent and was placed so to speak on waiting orders by fifteen hundred and one the admiral had conceived the project of a fourth voyage to be made with four caravels and one hundred and fifty men but before setting out in fifteen hundred and two he deposited his papers in safe-keeping drafted his will and wrote to the bank of st george in genoa offering a tenth of his yearly income for the reduction of food taxes in that commonwealth this last maritime enterprise was shared by his brother bartholomew and his son ferdinand now a lad of fourteen and had for its main motive the disclosure of some avenue by which asia that part of it where lay the riches might be attained in short columbus had now come to realize that thus far he had failed to reach the country of the great khan he felt that he must have reached asia but at a point lying to the south of cathay and india and as for flanking the difficulty by penetrating to the south yet further an immense tract of land a mainland interposed still in the interposing mass there must be a narrow place and through this a strait for the currents that set westward from jamaica so indicated it is to be observed that on this voyage he pretty much ceased to concern himself with sipangu so manifestly futile were all attempts to identify it with espaniola for a full year columbus skirted the coast of central america from cariari in nicaragua to the side of puerto bello in panama hearing of pepper and of people in rich clothing of commerce and of the river ganges in november fifteen hundred and four he returned to spain where isabella his patroness was at this time on her death-bed so that his many letters to the spanish court remained unacknowledged with some premonition of his own demise columbus now busied himself with his last will charging his son diego to provide for the maintenance of beatrix a person to whom i am under great obligations and let this he continues be done for the discharge of my conscience for it weighs heavy on my soul on may twenty fifteen hundred and six at valladolid broken discouraged well nigh forgotten even in spain the discoverer of america viceroy of the indies and admiral of the ocean breathed his last the discoverer of america strikingly illustrates the aphorism that the world's great men so far from having commonly been men of learning have often been but glorified enthusiasts to columbus the south the upper coast of south america at the mouths of the orinoco meant the terrestrial paradise of sir john mandeville a spot where the earth's surface ceasing to be rounded was pinched into a stem on the summit of which the paradise rested and down the sides of which rolled such mighty streams as the orinoco it meant also the golden Cheronese of ptolemy malay peninsula where in one year solomon gathered six hundred and fifty six quintals of gold and all manner of precious stones it was because of this south so gravely misconceived by him geographically that columbus anticipating the project of magellan entertained at the end of his second voyage the idea of returning to europe by way of the indian ocean if he had had an abundance of provisions says his son ferdinand he would not have returned to spain except by way of the east 
to say of columbus that he was not conspicuous for learning is but to repeat that his chief powers were moral not intellectual patience endurance tenacity energy and will these despite his ignorance made him great cupidity and vanity entailing boastfulness and craft we have noted as his chief weaknesses but as to cupidity the record is perhaps less vulnerable than it is at times represented throughout the years fifteen hundred to fifteen hundred and four the years preceding and including his fourth voyage gold was to columbus indeed a thing infinitely precious precious in itself but far more so as the indispensable justification of his life and work then it is that we find him writing gold is most excellent gold is treasure and he who possesses it does all he wishes to in this world and succeeds in helping souls into paradise columbus was religious formally and ceremoniously albeit sincerely religious from an early date in fact while at granada before his first voyage he had embraced the idea of rescuing the holy sepulchre from the infidel to this end he was resolved or so deemed himself to devote his profits from the indies and withal he was eloquent he waxed eloquent over the holy sepulchre and when after his third voyage he was put upon waiting orders alike to the impairment of his revenues and the wounding of his pride he waxed eloquent over that injustice i have arrived at and am in such a condition he writes in fifteen hundred that there is no person so vile but thinks that he may insult me he shall be reckoned in the world as valour itself who is courageous enough to consent to it if i were to steal the indies or the land which lies toward them of which i am now speaking from the altar of st peter and give them to the moors they could not show greater enmity toward me in spain who would believe such a thing where there was always so much magnanimity i undertook a fresh voyage to the new heaven and earth which up to that time had remained hidden and if it is not held there in esteem like the other voyages to the indies that is no wonder because it came to be looked upon as my work his yet more famous letter written in fifteen hundred and three from jamaica on his fourth voyage is the cry of a wolsey left naked to his enemies i was twenty-eight years old when i came into your highness's service and now i have not a hair upon me that is not grey my body is infirm and all that was left to me as well as to my brothers has been taken away and sold even to the frock that i wore to my great dishonour i implore your highnesses to forgive my complaints i am indeed in as ruined a condition as i have related hitherto i have wept over others may heaven now have mercy upon me and may the earth weep over me weep for me whoever has charity truth and justice in the spirit of that charity truth and justice which columbus here invokes let it be said that whatever his deflections from straightforwardness he was not alone therein in his age or profession martin behaim sebastian cabot and amerigo vespucci not one of them as a navigator dealt honestly with his own age or with posterity but points of character aside what in the case of the great genoese most excites wonder is not that he discovered america but that america should have remained to be discovered by him the expedition of tellies or that of dulmo and estrito behind might well have reached the western continent as early as fifteen hundred indeed vincente yanez pinzon for spain and pedralibares cabral for portugal touched the coast of south america furthermore as the region which was discovered by columbus perpetuates in the name antilles the mythical island of antilia so the region discovered by pinzon and cabral perpetuates in the name brazil the mythical island of brazil End of chapter two chapter three of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three balboa and the pacific when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in darien keats on first looking into chapman's homer in his espanola letter of october fourteen ninety eight to the spanish sovereigns columbus told them two things first that he had discovered the earthly paradise which being on the top of the stem of the earth was near heaven and unattainable save by god's permission and second that at pariah he had found pearls the latter announcement was the moving one and in fourteen ninety nine two private expeditions set forth almost simultaneously to the pearl coast one piloted by juan de la cosa but commanded by alonso de ojeda a knight of truly spanish audacity companion of columbus in fourteen ninety three and the other commanded by pero alonso nino one of columbus's pilots in fourteen ninety three and fourteen ninety eight the voyage of nino so far as the gathering of riches was concerned proved a success quite beyond anything achieved by columbus for it was rewarded by quantities of pearls ojeda was less successful in finding pearls but he brought away some two hundred natives to be sold as slaves in fifteen hundred and eight he was made governor of the district of uraba which extended from the darien atrato river eastward to the gulf of venezuela and was called castilla del oro west of uraba as far as cape gracias a dios in honduras the coast under the appellation of veragua was in fifteen hundred and eight assigned for government to diego de nisuesa a rich and accomplished planter of espanola the significance of ojeda and Nequesa, however lies not so much in themselves as in their three associates vespucci balboa and pizarro especially in balboa the true precursor of cortez with whom in a variety of respects he is not unworthy to be compared as for vespucci and pizarro the latter we shall meet presently and the former need not long detain us he was be it said an alert florentine who as contractor's clerk had seen to the outfitting of the ships for the second voyage of columbus and who had accompanied ojeda on his pearl-seeking voyage of fourteen ninety nine he had made three other transatlantic voyages the third of which by his literary handling of it in letters printed in latin in fifteen hundred and four and fifteen hundred and seven the former under the title of mundus novus had so established his fame that in fifteen hundred and seven mundus novus south america was beginning to be called america americ's land or america but to revert to balboa just as from the third voyage of columbus renowned for its pearls there resulted the voyage of ojeda bringing to the mainland of the indies vespucci so in fifteen hundred there resulted the voyage of rodrigo de bastidas bringing vasca nunez de balboa of balboa prior to this time we know only that he was a good sword player born in fourteen seventy four or fourteen seventy five in estramadura luckless at sea with bastidas he had resorted to farming in espanola and when in november fifteen hundred and nine ojeda and nicuesa started for their provinces he was restless to accompany one or other debt kept him back but he was resourceful and in september fifteen hundred and ten when ojeda's lieutenant martin fernandez de enciso prepared to follow his commander with supplies balboa it is said contrived to get himself smuggled on shipboard in a provision cask on the venezuelan coast near the present cartagena 
for it was here that enciso landed balboa encountered francisco pizarro a dutiful soldier under ojeda with a boatload of ojeda's men from him it was learned that ojeda having lost de la cosa in a fight and being himself seriously wounded had founded the refuge of san sebastian and then had departed for espanola for succour his colonists meantime desperate with hunger were roaming hither and yon in quest of food all straightway betook themselves to san sebastian but only to find it burned the question then arose as to what should be done in circumstances so adverse in answer up spoke balboa to the west of the gulf of uraba was a region darien abounding in food this he knew from having already visited it under bastidas there moreover the indians used no poisoned arrows missiles which had been the undoing of the headlong ojeda balboa was of good stature of knightly bearing and of frank address and his words took effect ojeda's colony transferred itself to darien where it founded santa maria la antigua del darien and being thus within the country which pertained to nisuesa promptly on balboa's suggestion deposed and ciso and chose as alcades or judges balboa and martin zamudio and as regidor or alderman a young nobleman juan de valdivia where though in the meantime was nisuesa ojeda had reached new andalusia with three hundred men and four small ships nisuesa had appeared off castilla del oro with nearly seven hundred men and five ships of large size and was now sailing to and fro looking for columbus's veragua the golden Cheronese, but to no issue except the loss of ships and the drowning and starving of his men marooned at length upon desert sand nisuesa himself and sixty half-naked followers embraced despair some muttered some raved some in fierce irony laughed aloud a jest it was ha ha a merry jest to adventure life for gold for lands and to rule one's fellows nisuesa was finally found and brought back to darien by his lieutenant but the colony which was originally ojeda's distrusted nisuesa and in march fifteen eleven putting him on board a leaky brigantine dispatched him to spain and that was the last that they or any one heard of this overbearing commander at this time diego columbus elder son of christopher columbus presided over the antilles as governor and admiral with residence in espanola on the continent of america tierra firma which now comprised central america and mundus novus south america no one presided opportunity therefore called for a ruler in tierra firma and not in vain for there was a man to respond by name vasco nunez de balboa all he lacked was legal authorization to obtain this being so far from spain he must do mighty deeds make himself potent and indispensable and this he set himself to do first he deported enciso to spain sending with him to offset a possible misrepresentation of his action the alcalde zamudio in the same ship but commissioned to stop in espanola and solicit the favour of don diego he sent valdivia don diego proved malleable and soon appointed balboa his lieutenant thereupon balboa shaped a career for conquest and discovery a career in which two points that stand out are his recognition of pizarro and his employment of blooded dogs francisco pizarro was an estramadurn like balboa and of about the same age he was ambitious yet peculiar from the fact that in a period of restless competition he was content to bide to serve and to be ever dutiful with regard to the dogs they were no new thing with the spaniard bartholomew columbus had used them in espanola though not quite as balboa was to use them in darien their breed was of the best and their fangs were deadly but they were sagacious and under firm discipline 
gold was balboa's object but the prime immediate requisite was food coretta cacique of cueva a district to the west of santa maria possessed both gold and food and he possessed furthermore a daughter balboa attacked the village of coretta and carried the cacique and his attractive daughter prisoners to santa maria here in turn the captor himself was made captive for he fell in love with the daughter and formed with coretta an alliance against that cacique's enemy Ponxa. to the west of coretta lay a rich and populous country of the atlantic seaboard ruled by a cacique comogre who to the amazement of the spaniards occupied a house constructed of posts and stone with carved woodwork an understanding with comogre became practicable through the understanding with coretta and momentous did it prove it made of balboa a discoverer a world discoverer the discoverer of the south sea or pacific ocean an achievement which had it only come a little sooner would in all probability have brought with it the conquest of peru camogre had seven sons one of whom Pansiaco, was of marked intelligence from him balboa learned of a cacique dwelling beyond a high sierra on the pacific side of the isthmus of darien and possessed withal of much gold this gold balboa resolved to see the baskets full the bags full the large vessels out of which the people ate and drank and he would see also the new strange waters beyond the sierra where according to report were ships with sails and oars but little less in size than those of the spaniards themselves the difficulty confronting balboa was that such an adventure required many men all seasoned and well equipped a thousand pansiaco said whereas the spaniard had but a few hundred and these meagre for lack of food so pressing indeed was the demand for food in darien that in january fifteen hundred and twelve valdivia back from espaniola was again sent forth this time expressly for provisions and to carry to diego columbus a letter telling of the great southward lying sea and employing the thousand men necessary for the seizure of its golden littoral nor was this all for balboa himself made an incursion into the country of the cacique da baeba a country not only by report in el dorado but what was more one known to be stocked abundantly with grain time sped and it now was october of fifteen hundred and twelve food had again run low and men and equipment were as scarce as before valdivia had failed to return nor had espaniola been otherwise heard from but the determination of balboa to establish himself in power by a successful south sea venture remained unshaken commissioners were sent to spain to unfold the situation to the king and to solicit aid of him directly hardly had they gone when two ships arrived from diego columbus bringing provisions and one hundred and fifty men but they brought something even more important and that was news news from spain zamudio wrote that roused by enciso's recital of the wrong suffered by nisuesa king ferdinand had ordered first that balboa be brought home under criminal indictment and second that enciso himself be granted indemnification presumably zamudio wrote also of a rumour that the king had in mind to appoint a governor for darien at any rate balboa deemed it imperative to try to gain personally the royal ear and on january twenty fifteen hundred and thirteen he addressed to ferdinand his celebrated letter of exculpation description and appeal i desire to give an account to your most royal highness of the great secrets and marvellous riches of this land of which god has made your most royal highness the lord and me the discoverer before any other that which is to be found down this coast to the westward is the province called coretta which is twenty leagues distant further down the coast at a distance of forty leagues from this city santa maria and twelve leagues inland there is a cacique called camogra in the mountains to the southward there are certain caciques who have great quantities of gold in their houses it is said these caciques store their gold in barbacoas like maize because it is so abundant that they do not care to keep it in baskets that all the rivers of these mountains contain gold 
and that they have very large lumps in great abundance i sire have myself been very near these mountains within a day's journey but i did not reach them because i was unable to do so owing to the want of men beyond these mountains the country is very flat toward the south and the indians say that the other sea is at a distance of three days journey they say that the people of the other coast are very good and well mannered and i am told that the other sea is very good for canoe navigation for that it is always smooth and never rough like the sea on this side according to the indians i believe that there are many islands in that sea they say that there are many large pearls and that the cacique's have baskets of them it is a most astonishing thing and without equal that our lord has made you the lord of this land then he asked for a thousand men from espanola for materials for the building of small ships pitch nails ropes and sails for master shipwrights and for arms two hundred crossbows with very strong stays and fittings and with long ranges two dozen good hand-guns of light metal to weigh not more than twenty-five to thirty pounds and for good powder none of balboa's demands however were to be granted indeed by the time his commissioners reached spain in may fifteen hundred thirteen it is probable that the decision had been made to supersede him of this as we have seen he had received intimation and with or without men and munitions he must act upon his action depended everything his fame his fortune and his life balboa set forth on september sixth fifteen hundred thirteen from coretta's country caledonia bay directly southward across the isthmus of darien to the gulf of san miguel with him he took one hundred and ninety spaniards he took also hundreds of indian slaves as attendants and burden-bearers coretta's daughter was still his spouse and through this fortunate connection he obtained provisions and guides the arms of his men were the usual swords crossbows and arquebuses but more formidable than all other means of foray were the dogs the bloodhounds the distance to be traversed was not great about forty-five miles but the obstacles were as formidable as the distance was trifling a cacique named caraqua proved the most redoubtable foe and fell upon the spaniards with a confident and yelling host he was however quickly put to flight by the discharges from the crossbows and arquebuses and after the fleeing men leaped the dogs then drawing their swords the spaniards according to peter martyr made bloody havoc hewing from one an arm from another a leg from him a buttock from another a shoulder and from some the neck from the body at one stroke the country at first was a succession of streams and swamps screened by interlacing vines and creepers the home of gorgeous flowers and brilliant birds but no less the dwelling-place of countless chattering monkeys and inconvenient reptiles everywhere stretched forests of trees stupendous dark and so festooned as to be almost impenetrable even to the axe at length the journey was over on the twenty fifth of september balboa was at the base of an elevation which his guides told him looked upon the sea of the south the mar del sur as the spaniards long henceforth were to call it some sixty-six or sixty-seven men only were equal to the ascent with these balboa clambered to a point near the summit bidding them pause the ambitious explorer went himself says peter martyr alone to the top here he looked long and prayed then he beckoned to his men who gathered about him and stared at the pacific among the number thus silent upon a peak in darien was francisco pizarro to him the situation was a congenial one duty had been performed and there was no need for utterance but what were his thoughts in the golden vessels said to be used by tu banama he did he surmise anything of peru quite likely not still distant regions of a new civilization were now and again heard of in darien once a refugee from the great lands far toward the west came upon a spanish official reading and starting with surprise exclaimed you also have books but this by the way pizarro the dutiful captain was now straightway sent forward by balboa to discover the shore of the sea they had gazed upon 
and on september twenty ninth fifteen hundred thirteen st michael's day balboa himself with drawn sword and uplifted banner advanced to meet the tide they stood facing a gulf and in honor of the day they named it san miguel and here there came to the spaniards an unmistakable intimation of peru tamaco cacique of one of the gulf tribes replying to questions by balboa as to the extent of this new coast told him that the mainland extended to the south without end and that far in that direction dwelt a nation fabulously rich who sailed the ocean in ships and used beasts of burden to illustrate the beasts he formed from clay the figure of the llama which seemed a kind of camel this says herrera the spanish historian was the second intimation vasco nunez and we may add francisco pizarro had of peru in fifteen hundred and thirteen darien was still to explorers as it had been to columbus the malay peninsula the golden Chernese, the approach to india it is thought notes the indefatigable martyr that not far from the colony of san miguel lies the country where the fruitfulness of spice beginneth to dispel this illusion there was required the voyage of magellan a voyage not merely to america but through america and beyond it prior to the time of this voyage in fifteen hundred and nineteen to fifteen hundred and twenty two america was thought of only as a part of the continent of asia magellan detached america and gave it an independent existence but at the time of the discovery of the south sea itself columbus's idea of america as a land of pertinent and subsidiary to asia prevailed and had balboa reached peru or mexico he would have believed himself in india even by cortez mexico was thought to be the golden Chernese. after discovering the gulf of san miguel and finding isla rica rich in pearls balboa turned northward and reached santa maria on january nineteenth fifteen hundred and fourteen here the whole people welcomed him and eagerly viewed his treasure for once in the indies however treasure to the spaniards was a thing of secondary account the new sea was what these men cared about the mar del sur what of it from darien balboa dispatched pedro de arbolancha as a special messenger to ferdinand with the great news and as typical of the new sea and of the auriferous realms where to supposedly it was tributary he entrusted to his messenger by way of gift for the king not merely gold but two hundred lustrous pearls the fruit of the waters of this great southern sea but if tales of wealth in the west had given to balboa his rise similar tales were to contribute to his fall a story gained currency that in darien the natives were accustomed to fish for gold with nets the prospect of such fishing appealed with special force to an elderly gentleman of segovia pedro arias de avila and as balboa was to be displaced and arias or pedrarius as he is known had money and friends he was made governor with jurisdiction reaching from the gulf of maracaibo to cape gracias a dios the expedition of pedrarius set sail from san lucar on april eleventh fifteen hundred and fourteen prior to this time one of the greatest expeditions to leave spain for the indies had been the second commanded by columbus which had sailed from cadiz in fourteen hundred and ninety three in point of eminence however the names connected with the expedition of pedrarius outshone those of its early predecessor in high degree there were for example gonzalo fernandez de oviedo who together with las casas had beheld the triumph of columbus after his first voyage francisco vasquez coronado de valdez quixotic and chivalric seeker after the seven cities of cibola hernando de soto discoverer of the mississippi and bernal diaz del castillo companion to be of cortez and rugged chronicler of his deeds many adventurers some two thousand men who were anxious to go had to be left behind for want of room those taken numbered about fifteen hundred and the show they made was brilliant enough largely they were young nobles and gentlemen who had expected to follow gonsalvo de cordoba to the italian wars 
and they came wearing their silks and brocades and provided with gleaming armour for which they had gone heavily into debt upon the imagination of such writes washington irving the very idea of an unknown sea and splendid empire broke with the vague wonders of an arabian tale finally pedrarius brought with him his wife the resolute isabel of bobadilla and a bishop for darien the first prelate of tierra firma juan de quevedo both the lady and the bishop it is worthy to be remarked fell under the spell of the gallantry of vasco nunez de baboa as for pedrarius himself he was skilful with the lance and had fought against the portuguese and the moors but was now elderly and somewhat infirm in temper he was arbitrary and wily sir arthur helps deems him a suspicious fiery arbitrary old man an epigrammatic american thinks he had a swarthy soul and even john fisk pronounces him a green-eyed pitiless perfidious old wretch his first business was to arrest balboa and bring him to trial for misdeeds against incisa and niciesa but the charges fell flat save that Enciso, who had been given office under pedrarius was awarded civil damages for loss of property then for a period balboa was ignored and the followers of pedrarius mad for gold were let loose upon the isthmus between june thirty fifteen hundred and fourteen and january fifteen hundred and seventeen a dozen expeditions sent ostensibly to connect the atlantic ocean with the pacific ravaged the country the cruelties inflicted upon the natives were monstrous some says oviedo were roasted others were mangled by dogs others were hanged driven to desperation the indians at length turned upon their persecutors spaniards when caught were not only slain but were tortured to death legs and arms were severed by sharp stones or the captive was bound and gagged and molten gold was poured down his throat the indians meanwhile in mockery bidding the helpless christians eat eat and take your fill on leaving his ships pedrarius had sought to impress the darien settlers with his might and magnificence but the silken and brocaded lords and gentlemen who so largely constituted his retinue had not turned out well disease and famine had fast laid hold upon them forcing them to barter scarlet tunics for corn or to feed on herbage or to drop exhausted in the wilderness until their souls deserted them full seven hundred of them still these untoward circumstances bad as they were were not what exasperated pedrarius most at his side inactive but observing cogitative and critical stood balboa whom nothing escaped writing to the king on october sixteenth fifteen hundred and fifteen balboa with a touch of the style of mark antony describes the governor as an honourable man but one who takes little heed of the interest of your majesty and one in whom reigns all the envy and avarice in the world alluding to the cruelties to the indians he calls them the greatest ever heard of in arabian or christian country and says that whereas these indians formerly were as sheep now they are as fierce as wolves had pedrarius been less unsuccessful in governing than he was no single jurisdiction could have continued to hold both him and vasco nunez de balboa they were incompatible beings of whom one must go down before the other how true this was became apparent when early in fifteen hundred and fifteen the full strength of pedrarius's resentment was evoked through jealousy balboa's messenger arbo lancha who had been sent to report to ferdinand the discovery of the south sea had reached spain but shortly after the departure of pedrarius with his gold his pearls and his magic tales of balboa's preemption of the realms of ophir arbo lancha quite won over ferdinand especially as balboa had cost the crown nothing whereas pedrarius had cost it much balboa was thereupon created an adelantado of the south sea and captain-general of cueva and panama under the nominal supervision of pedrarius as governor of darien the governor well knew that an adelantado ship though technically a lieutenancy was in reality a provincial governorship a kind of proconsulship and something which in the hands of a balboa might easily be transformed into a position of independent power 
to pedrarius two courses lay open one was to forestall the new adelantado by going to the pacific seaboard himself the other was to institute against him further public proceedings during the pendency of which his commission might be withheld emphasizing the first course pedrarius sent gaspar de morales and francisco pizarro to the west shore of the gulf of san miguel to seize the pearl islands and he sent yet farther west an expedition which reached the peninsula of perita he in person founded acla on the atlantic coast near the site of the subsequent caledonia harbour and through gaspar de espinosa alcalde mayor or chief judge of darien penetrated to the extreme west as far as the gulf of nicoya nicoya in the present costa rica the second course against balboa the withholding of his commission proved wholly a failure for the bishop of darien to whom it was of necessity disclosed denounced it roundly in public from the pulpit events now moved apace balboa after the interview of arbalancha with ferdinand received a letter from the king written in august fifteen hundred and fourteen informing him that pedrarius had been instructed to treat him well with this assurance balboa had therefore resolved to make his atalanta do ship a reality by exploring the coasts of the south sea regardless of the governor by secretly obtaining supplies from cuba balboa nearly brought about his own downfall but the situation was retrieved by bishop quevedo who persuaded pedrarius very possibly dona isabel was here a factor to become reconciled and give to the courtly balboa his eldest daughter dona maria in betrothal the arrangement whatever may have been the motive of pedrarius in countenancing it in no wise changed his feeling toward balboa an instinctive jealousy and suspicion to balboa on the contrary the arrangement was not unpleasing he still loved coretta's daughter dona maria was at school in spain his marriage with her could be deferred pedrarius meanwhile could not well oppose the passage of the adelantado his prospective son-in-law to the latter's province on the pacific what balboa needed was ships these to the number of four brigantines he built from the forest on the northern side of the sierra below alcla and thousands of impressed indians carried them in sections over the ridge to the waters of the river balsas sabana which flowed into the gulf of san miguel but the timbers proved rotten and the work of shipbuilding had to be done all over again done however it finally was and balboa stood exultant on the beach of isla rica gazing south seaward the nights at this season were clear we are told and a certain great star rode in the heavens above now it seems that just after balboa's discovery of the pacific a venetian travelling astrologer who was in santa maria had pointed out to him the star telling him that when it attained in the heavens a definite point he was to beware as mortal peril faced him the crisis safely passed he would be fortune's child the greatest lord and captain in all the indies and with all the richest turning to friends who were with him balboa on one occasion spoke of the star and ridiculed the astrologer have i not he said three hundred men and four ships and the countenance officially of pedrarius from time to time news had reached darien that as balboa had been superseded by pedrarius so the latter was to be superseded by lopa de sosa acting governor of the canary islands such news now that balboa was on working terms with pedrarius was not welcome to him for a change in governors might cause him delay so the adelantado remarked to his notary that it would be well to send to acla to ascertain whether lopa de sosa were yet arrived if he were then balboa could not put to sea too soon if he were not some much-needed iron and pitch might be obtained and the preparations could be continued four men composed the party to go to acla andres carabito luis botello fernando munoz and andres de valderabana they were to make their visit by night and to gather information from the servant who would be found in balboa's house but the crisis foretold by the astrologer registered by the star had come 
garabito under a dissembling exterior hated balboa for having admonished him against attempted familiarities with coretta's daughter he had even written to pedrarius that balboa cared not for dona maria to whom he was betrothed and meant at the earliest opportunity to renounce the governor personally as well as politically furthermore the remark of balboa about a speedy putting to sea had been overheard by a sentry who mistaking it for treason had so reported it to garabito or botelho finally the period within which the adelantado was to be ready for sea under agreement with the governor had been much exceeded and pedrarius would not extend it and when balboa's chief financial backer fernando de aguello wrote advising a putting to sea at once the letter was intercepted garabito and botelho on their nocturnal visit to acla were both apprehended and what they related to pedrarius deeply implicated balboa in disloyalty and intrigue how the story roused pedrarius primitive spaniard that he was to a cold fury distinctly appears in the countermeasures which he took to balboa he penned a beguiling letter inviting him to come to acla to francisco pizarro the model subordinate the ever dutiful one he at the same time gave orders to gather a force meet balboa and arrest him the adelantado came warnings he received but he disregarded them before he had crossed the sierra he was met by pizarro's force the leader himself stepped forward and made the arrest it is not thus said balboa smiling sadly that you were wont to come forth to receive me francisco pizarro balboa's trial was conducted by the alcalde mayor or chief judge gaspar de espinosa and the adelantado's entire record from the days of enciso and nisuesa was admitted against him even so he would have been allowed an appeal to the crown had it not been for the governor who would not assent to it at santa maria in the plaza a scaffold and block were prepared and early in the morning of a day in january fifteen hundred and nineteen balboa was led forth in chains before him walked the town crier exclaiming behold the traitor and usurper tis false retorted balboa never have i been disloyal with this he mounted the scaffold and received the sacrament his head was then cut off upon a hatchment cloth and stuck upon a pole the same day until past nightfall were beheaded in ghastly succession valderabano batelio munoz and arguello pedrarius it is said witnessed the executions from behind the shelter of a lattice while as for garabito he reaped a not uncommon reward of treachery in the salvation of his own life thus the third voyage of columbus the voyage for pearls brought about as a first great result the occupation of that part of the mainland of america now known as the isthmus of panama and the discovery of the pacific ocean as its second great result it brought about though less directly the occupation of mexico a tale which remains to be told End of chapter three chapter four part one of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four cortez and mexico where dwell the gods where dwell the gods oh dwell they in the sky the gods are always nigh raymond the aztec god but what of the young nobleman valdivia o oh, you wretched men of darien exclaims peter martyr tarry for valdivia whom you sent to provide to help your necessities provide for yourselves rather and trust not to them whose fortune ye know not juan de valdivia it will be remembered had in january fifteen hundred and twelve set out from santa maria of darien for espanola to solicit of don diego columbus a supply of food his return long looked for never came his ship was wrecked off jamaica and he was carried in an open boat with a few followers to the coast of yucatan here he was seized by the local cacique and with three others was sacrificed to the gods 
his heart being torn out and his flesh eaten some of the company were kept prisoners one by one they died till two only were left gonzalo guerrero a seaman and geronimo de aguilar a friar both of whom some eight years later were found as will be seen by cortez columbus never reached yucatan but on his first voyage he heard of the culture of a people called the mayas who wore clothes and dwelt on a mainland ten days journey in a canoe from espanola and on his fourth voyage he came on july thirty fifteen hundred and two into actual touch with this civilization near the island of guanaya off the coast of honduras here he encountered a monster canoe provided with an awning and laden with merchandise a canoe bearing a cacique clad in loincloth and mantle one furthermore which was being propelled by a band of twenty-five indians well clothed nor was columbus's acquaintance with the maya culture limited to the sight of the canoe near cariari nicaragua he personally visited a mountain tomb as large as a house and elaborately sculptured where there stood or crouched as though peering within the corpse of a maya indian he saw also he tells us some large sheets of cotton cloth elaborately and cleverly worked and other sheets maya manuscripts very delicately painted as compared with the nahuas of mexico pre-aztec as well as aztec the mayas of yucatan were an ancient a peaceful and a polished race and like all races that have advanced as far as barbarism they were emphatically religious their most characteristic deity perhaps was itzamna god of the east or rising sun inventor of letters but there was another sun deity kukulkan the most active and imminent of the maya gods he was patron of arts and crafts inculcator of peace and withal deprecator of human sacrifices a god of order who having founded cities had departed into the sunrise whence he had promised to return at a future time war gods there were in the maya pantheon but war and religion despite some human sacrifices were not the intimate blend that they were in mexico if the death of aldivia and his three fellow unfortunates upon a heathen altar may be regarded as demanding of heaven to be avenged vengeance nevertheless was somewhat delayed valdivia died in fifteen hundred and twelve up to that time but little had been done to subdue and occupy the antilles outside of espaniola in fifteen hundred and nine diego columbus had sent a governor to jamaica and in fifteen hundred eleven he had made diego velasquez governor of cuba a land which christopher columbus had never recognized as insular but which had been officially demonstrated so to be by a voyage of circumnavigation effected by sebastian de ocampo in fifteen hundred and eight velasquez was jocose and affable but at the same time acquisitive and envious to cuba he took with him or soon summoned to follow him francisco hernandez de cordoba juan de grijalva bartolome de la casas panfilo de narvarez and hernan cortez narvarez did the work of pacification while velasquez founded trinidad puerto del principe matanza santo espiritu san salvador habana and santiago in fifteen hundred sixteen because of the continued famine in darien governor pedrarius gave leave to his silken host as many as wished to go to cuba where provisions were not lacking and one hundred and ten went 
velasquez met them cordially and promised them land if they would wait for vacancies but they were tired of a passive role and craved activity slave catching though contrary to law was at this time practised in the island and it no doubt was with the profits from such an enterprise in view that the darien arrivals made ready an expedition which would serve as an outlet for their energies they chartered two vessels velasquez it is said contributing a third and on february eighth fifteen hundred and seventeen with hernandez de cordoba now a rich planter of santo espiritu as captain unfurled their sails from san cristobal the old habana whither should they fare their chief pilot counselled adventuring straight into the west into the region of the people who wore clothes the squadron about the first or second of march reached the island of las mugueras island of women and on the fourth landed at point catoche the extreme northeasterly limit of yucatan their next landing was at champoton in campeche where they tediously worked their way back to san cristobal by way of the peninsula of florida on this expedition the spaniards were roughly handled by the natives both cordoba and bernal diaz were wounded the former so severely that soon after reaching cuba he died but the invaders succeeded in bringing away two youths whom they named respectively melchor and julian and to whom they taught spanish that they might serve as interpreters foiled as to slave-catching but curious regarding yucatan the cuban settlers by fifteen hundred and eighteen were ready for a second adventure into the west and this time it was Velasquez who took the lead he managed to add two vessels to two others left from the expedition of cordoba enlisted some two hundred and fifty men and appointed juan de grijalva commander-in-chief sail was made from santiago de cuba on the eighth of april with alaminos once more as chief pilot and on the third of may the fleet gained to the southward of point catoche a large island called cozumel island of swallows by the last of the month the expedition had passed lake terminas and by the eighteenth of june various rivers of tabasco such as rio de grillalva and rio de banderas and various islands off mexico including san juan de ulia and isla de sacrificios they made a landing where now stands the city of vera cruz grillalva under the orders given him might trade in any regions discovered but he might not colonize and as the country everywhere by its aspect invited to colonization alvarado on the twenty fourth of june was permitted to sail for cuba to carry back the sick report progress and if possible obtain permission to form settlements meanwhile grillalva followed the mexican coast as far north as cape royo whence returning to yucatan he sailed for cuba reaching mantanzas about the first of november on both the cordoba and grillalva expeditions the spaniards were impressed by divers things but more than with anything else by the scenery the sacrificial mounds and the stone temples on every island and dotting the coast of the mainland were to be seen mounds pyramidal in form ascended by stone steps and surmounted by temple towers of squat masonry the towers gleamed white and over them floated the smoke of incense and of sacrifice at campeche cordoba saw many temples or prayer palaces wedded within with fresh blood from each there swarmed angrily forth half a score of priests armed with braziers and clad in white mantles down which fell their hair long black and dishevelled so matted and clotted with blood from their own ears lacerated in penance that one strand could not be separated from another indeed the farther to the west the spaniards fared the closer their approach that is to say to the nahua tribes of mexico as distinguished from the maya of yucatan the more the evidences of human sacrifices multiplied 
why asked grijalva of a tabasco indian this ripping open of human bodies and offering of bloody hearts to hungry gods because was the reply the people of yulia by which was meant mexico will have it so when in november fifteen hundred and eighteen grijalva reached cuba then called isla fernandina he found himself most undeservedly out of favour he was young handsome and chivalric but above all conscientious so conscientious that las casas tells us he would have made a good monk having been ordered not to plant colonies he had obeyed but obedience proved to be his undoing for angered by it his subordinates particularly alvarado whom he had reproved had misrepresented him to velasquez and already that grasping ruler had decided upon a new voyage in which grijalva was not to share for this new voyage velasquez sought a commander of quite supermundane qualities one astute and valiant enough to achieve rare deeds and at the same time subservient enough to give all the honours and emoluments to velasquez the governor profiting by grijalva's labours had already on the thirteenth of november secured for himself the andalanta ship of all that he had discovered in the west or might thereafter discover there and his solicitude to make just the right choice of a commander was intense then as not seldom in human affairs stepped in fate the ironical mocking fate to diego velasquez tremulous with apprehension lest he choose wrongly for himself fate dictated the selection of hernan cortez it has been said that the rise of cortez was due to the third voyage of columbus and the statement is true in that his rise was part of the movement following upon columbus's pearl discoveries a movement which through nicuesa and Olleda begat balboa and through balboa begat pedrarius and through pedrarius those activities in cuba which resulted in the expeditions of cordoba and grijalva apropos of columbus in this connection regret at times has found voice that it was not he who conquered mexico rather than cortez there it is said he would have found fulfilment of his dream of gold if not of spicery in measure far more complete than in asia and india for in the fifteenth century the cathay of marco polo as also polo's sepangu were vanished things but to each his task the mexican conquest called for traits at least one of which ruthlessness columbus did not possess it called that is to say for the traits which were peculiarly spanish and it called for all of them for ruthlessness for pride for devoutness and for romanticism these traits combined and co-ordinated in a unique manner belonged to cortez hernan cortez was born in medellin in estramadura in fourteen hundred and eighty five his parents were as who in those days in spain was not of noble descent though poor as he was delicate in health he was destined for the law at fourteen he entered the university of salamanca where he remained two years acquiring a smattering of latin and some ease in rhetoric on leaving the university he looked about him he might join the banner of the great captain cordoba as had been the frustrated purpose of so many of the followers of pedrarius or he might go to the indies the indies were his choice and thither in fifteen hundred and four he took passage this was the period just subsequent to the coming of nicolas de ovando to espanola as governor and cortez after some hesitation was induced by ovando to become a planter in fifteen hundred and ten he would have joined nicuesa on his baragua castilla del oro expedition but was prevented by an abscess under the right knee in fifteen hundred and eleven diego velasquez who admired his intelligence took him to cuba as business adviser or private secretary cortez was young and famed for his amorous gallantries according to reports not altogether illuminating his affairs in cuba involved him 
in discord with velasquez catalina suarez was the name of one of his enamoratas and her he married by fifteen eighteen velasquez despite differences had appointed him alcalde at santiago de cuba cortez was now thirty-three he was of medium stature compact and muscular and had dark eyes good features a short beard and legs a trifle bowed outwardly he was frank and vivacious but inwardly he was calculating and self-contained since fifteen hundred and sixteen in espaniola diego columbus as admiral and governor had been under the supervisory authority of three monks known as the geronimite fathers who had been sent to the indies at the instance of las casas to temper somewhat with mercy the dealings of spaniards with the natives and it was necessary to obtain from them sanction for enterprises such as that for which velasquez had selected cortez velasquez obtained the requisite sanction and on the twenty third of october before grijalva's own return from the west he issued instructions authorizing as in grijalva's case exploration but not colonization cortez was now energy itself he mortgaged his estate he secured a large contribution from velasquez he stuck a plume in his bonnet he hoisted a banner he issued proclamations by these means and by enacting throughout a jovial role he gathered out of cuba and jamaica eleven vessels five hundred and eight soldiers and one hundred and nine seamen by february tenth fifteen hundred nineteen but there were difficulties and the gravest of these was a distrust of cortez which was more and more perceptibly defining itself in the mind of the governor like the chorus in the drama of antiquity the fool or jester of early modern drama performed a work of prognosis he forecast the issue such a fool de iago columbus had about him officially in the person of a sharp-witted dwarf named francisquillo this oracle unlike the fool in lear did not say openly to his master thou hadst little wit in thy ball crown when thou gavest thy golden one away but he said what was equivalent to it to velasquez as one day along with cortez he surveyed the harbour of santiago alive with the preparation of cortez's fleet francisquillo who was capering about exclaimed have a care diego diego lest this estramaduran captain of yours make off with the fleet herein it is said the distrust on the part of velasquez took its rise cortez did not slink from santiago with his ships in the night he left openly in the daytime after embracing the governor but he was nevertheless closely watched indeed velasquez's distrust of him continued to grow for he made frantic efforts to supersede him at trinidad and to stop him and apprehend him at san cristobal in his train cortez took a notable band of spanish gentlemen ten staunch captains each in command of a company with himself in command of the eleventh the arms carried were thirty-two crossbows thirteen firelocks and an outfit of swords and spears the whole reinforced by artillery in the form of ten bronze guns breech loaders and four falconets but above and beyond all else were sixteen noble horses about which more anon the general rendezvous was cape san antonio the most westerly point of cuba whence on the eighteenth of february the expedition all save pedro de alvarado's ship which was driven aside by tempest set its prows for cozumel at this time there was no knowledge in the indies of the fate of the valdivia party but on the cordoba expedition indians of campeche had saluted the spaniards with the word castellan and this was deemed significant at any rate after much inquiry on the yucatan coast and much dispatching of messengers inland aguilar appeared though guerrero did not provided thus with a reliable interpreter for melchor and julian had proved wanting and aguilar was willing cortez early in march set sail with his fleet for the country of the cacique tabasco the halting point of the spaniards was an island in the tabasco or 
yalva river but when they sought to establish themselves on the mainland christened by cortez new spain they were vigorously withstood a fight took place on the twenty fifth of march and fortune was turned in favor of the spaniards and against overwhelming bodies of indians by the artillery and the horses in darien where the natives were lower in the scale of barbarism than in yucatan and mexico balboa had already won triumphs by the aid of powerful dogs but to the east of the gulf of uraba that region of the poisoned arrow dogs had not been found effective and in yucatan and mexico where the missiles most in use were darts javelins sling-stones and the obsidian edge sword-club or maquahutl dogs save for hunting purposes were eschewed what in darien was accomplished by the dog was accomplished in the region farther west by the horse at tabasco or rather on the plain of kutla near by the horses supported by the cannon therefore won the day the indians who covered the whole plain who wore great feather crests and quilted cotton armor who carried drums and trumpets and rained upon their foe arrows javelins and stones were finally hemmed in between the spanish guns which ploughed through their masses and the spanish horse who under cortez himself speared them down and so were brought to a stand in the eyes of the terrorized barbarians the guns with their thunder and lightning were a marvel but the horsemen were a greater marvel still for they were each a living monster horse and rider in the words of bernal diaz being all one animal it was at the close of this battle that the tabascans suing for peace brought to cortez twenty young women among them dona marina as she came to be known a truly great chieftainess a daughter of caciques and a mistress of vassals marina was aztec but as a little girl had been given by her mother to the indians of tabasco in order to make way for the succession of a half-brother to the headship of her tribe cortez at first did not bestow upon her especial notice merely assigning her to a distinguished gentleman what made her fortune was her knowledge of both nahua and maya speech combined with her intelligence the rescued aguilar who spoke the maya of yucatan and tabasco readily understood the maya of tabasco as spoken by marina so as it proved the chain of tongues indispensable to cordez was complete marina translating aztec nahua into tabascan maya which aguilar in turn put into castilian spanish cortez who no less than columbus was devout spent palm sunday of the year fifteen hundred and nineteen at tabasco where a religious procession was held and mass was sung and where the indians were stoutly exhorted to give up their bloody sacrifices and idols the fleet then set sail and by holy thursday was at the island of san juan de ulioa where the spaniards first came to a definite knowledge of the existence and importance of montezuma it is true that at tabasco grijalva had heard of a calua or ulua where there was plenty of gold but in the words of the chronicler we did not know what this culia could be at san juan de ulia the fleet of cortez lay at anchor its fiery purpose clothed as some one has said in dissembling white hardly had it assumed its position when from two large canoes there ascended to the deck of the flagship a group of indians asking for tlatoan or chief they did him reverence but beyond this they were unable to make themselves understood thereupon marina who with other slave girls was standing by said to aguilar that the indians were mexicans sent by the cacique quitlalpitoc a servant of montezuma and that he wished to know whence the strangers had come and why so was begun a series of interchanges between cortez and the overlord of culua or mexico interchanges conducted on the part of the one with veiled though ever mounting audacity and on the part of the other with veiled though ever deepening apprehension for more than a fortnight cortez encouraged the coming of embassies for trade first came quitlalpitoc accompanied by his superior tutulili 
and with them they brought cotton fabrics done in brilliant feather designs ten bales of them as also articles of wrought gold set with rare stones in return cortez gave a carved and inlaid armchair some engraved stones a crimson cap beads and a gilt helmet which toot lily had wondered at and was told to bring back filled with gold dust the spaniard asked also for a time and place to be fixed at which he might meet montezuma then in due season came a second embassy one headed by a cacique named quintalbor who in looks resembled cortez with quintalbor came tutelili and this time besides cotton fabrics embroidered in feathers and gold there were brought large plumes of bright colour spangled with gold and pearls great feather fans rods of gold like a magistrate's staff collars and necklaces with pendant golden bells headdresses of green quetzal feathers and gold or of feathers and silver miniature golden fish alligators ducks monkeys pumas and jaguars a graceful bow with twelve sharp arrows all these things to say naught of nahua books executed in picture writing upon cotton or bark nor yet were these things all for dominating the entire collection were a wheel of gold as large as a cartwheel a wheel of silver equally large the twain worth in american money of to-day some two hundred and ninety thousand dollars and the helmet at which tutelili had wondered filled with grains of gold fresh from the placers the object of this second embassy was clearly to bribe cortez into leaving the country for to his wish again earnestly expressed to visit montezuma many objections were courteously interposed the refusal indeed was soon made pointed and explicit for tutelili having gone through the form of carrying to his lord the spanish leader's reiterated request came back after ten days bearing a quantity of robes feathers and gems as a gift to be carried by cortez personally to his own overlord the spanish king having thus felt out montezuma and his magnificence cortez saw his goal before him but could he reach it reach it he must if he would escape outlawry already he had broken with velasquez for at tabasco he had taken possession in the name of the king alone his position was like that of balboa after he had deported and so and had heard of the golden shored pacific he must seize his opportunity he must do or die as a first step cortez resolved upon a new basis for his expedition the soldiers must become a spanish colony looking immediately to the king over this colony he himself must be chosen captain-general and justicia mayor as such he could found a settlement taking care by destroying his fleet to remove from his followers all temptation to resume relations with cuba and velasquez even so however the situation for cortez was fraught with difficulty assuming the successful establishment of direct relations with charles v successor to ferdinand on the spanish throne how about the indians what would be their attitude toward the appropriation of montezuma's wealth by the arrogant white strangers the white strangers from out the sunrise but just here a stroke of fortune across the sand dunes above the san juan de ulua anchorage came one day soon after the departure of the last of the embassies from montezuma five indians they were not aztec but two of their number spoke nahua and by aid of marina and anguilar it was quickly learned that they were totonacs subject to montezuma and hating him with a deadly fear their principal settlement kempoala was a short distance inland to the north and here eager for a conference with the white chieftain waited their cacique into the hands of cortez was given a possible solution of his difficulty and he was not slow to perceive it cortez approached kempoala overland with four hundred men and two light guns while the fleet ascended the coast some ten leagues to a harbour called bernal discovered by francisco de montejo at the anchorage opposite san juan de ulua the present vera cruz it was not only hot and damp but according to bernal diaz there were always there 
many mosquitoes both long-legged ones and small ones the way to Kempuala wound through tropical forests filled with birds of startling plumage and dominated throughout by the snow-crowned peak of orizaba star mountain gleaming in majesty to the south and west as for the settlement itself it was the first great town the product of barbarism which the spaniards had seen from out a plaza rose towered temples on pyramidal foundations while the sides of the square were formed by terrace roof buildings of stone and adobe the whole brilliant with white stucco Kempuala was dazzling but no less was it beautiful not only did it shine like silver of which some of the spaniards at first thought it to be constructed but its houses were embowered in green and against this green and the white walls beneath glowed the massed colours of tropical flowers roses in particular abounded as the spaniards entered and marched along they were met by deputations which showered roses upon the horsemen to cortez some handed bouquets while others flung rose garlands about his neck or placed wreaths on his helmet the foot soldiers too were remembered for to them were given pineapples cherries juicy zapotes and aromatic anonas the palace or official abode of the cacique was at length reached and though that personage was very sedate he was so corpulent and shook so when he walked that the spaniards could not be restrained from laughing at him hardly had cortez arrived in the Kempualan district when proof of the dread which the overlord of ulua or mexico inspired was dramatically revealed five of montezuma's tribute men appeared haughty and insolent was their mien and upon them the Kempualans attended like slaves their shining hair says bernal diaz was gathered up as though tied on their heads and each one was smelling the roses that he carried and each had a crooked staff in his hand the meaning of the visit was that montezuma resented the fact that Kempuala was entertaining the white strangers especially as by the last embassy sent to cortez it had been made plain that their presence in mexico was no longer desired expiation therefore was demanded and of the Kempualan youth men and maids twenty must accompany the tribute men to ulua and yield their hearts upon the altar cortez's purpose in Kempuala was to cement an alliance with the totonacs yet to avoid as long as possible a break with the lord of ulua he secretly ordered the Kempualans to throw montezuma's envoys into prison and to withhold tribute at the same time he ingratiated himself with montezuma by covertly liberating the prisoners and sending them to their lord with the tale of their deliverance at his hands montezuma therefore reopened relations with the spanish leader by sending a further embassy bearing presents upon this delegation cortez wrought with great effect by resorting to his never-failing dependence the horse verily to the mexicans the neck of the horse was clothed with thunder the glory of his nostrils was terrible he swallowed the ground with fierceness and rage and said among the trumpets ha ha having concluded an alliance with the totonacs cortez founded in june fifteen hundred and nineteen in bernal harbour his projected settlement the town of villarica de la vera cruz and in july he sent to the king letters explanatory of the proceeding just prior to this in renewed fury of missionary zeal a fury which father olmedo priest to the army did his best somewhat to restrain he had thrown down the idols at Kempuala and cleansed the temples of blood his next acts were to scuttle and sink his ships to lash mutilate or hang various velasquez conspirators and to frighten away an expedition sent out by the governor of jamaica there now remained as the one sole objective of the spaniards in mexico montezuma and his goal montezuma is lord of many kings his equal is not known in all the world in his house many lords serve barefooted with eyes cast down to the ground he has thirty thousand vassals in his empire each of whom has one hundred thousand fighting men 
each year twenty thousand persons are regularly sacrificed in his dominions some years fifty thousand montezuma dwells in the most beautiful the largest and the strongest city in the world a city built in the water possessing a noble palace and plaza one of the centre of one the centre of an immense traffic hither flock princes from all the earth bringing incalculable riches no lord however great is there who does not pay tribute and no one so poor is there who does not give at least the blood of his arm the cost of all is enormous for besides his household montezuma is constantly waging war and maintaining vast armies these words of the cacique olintatl echoed in the ears of cortez as on august thirty one fifteen hundred and nineteen he departed from the friendly totonac country on his way to pay that visit to montezuma which had been so persistently declined had it been columbus what more of confirmation would he have required that he was about to behold the city and court of the great khan as it was even the practical-minded cortez felt himself impelled to write according to our judgment it is credible that there is everything in this country which existed in that from which solomon is said to have brought the gold for the temple End of chapter four part one chapter four part two of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four cortez and mexico mexico tenochtitlan abode of the war god the place of the stone and prickly pear seat of the power of montezuma whereof the spaniards had heard under the name yulia was a wonderful place to the spaniard but he failed to understand its real significance what the spaniard found in mexico as he believed was merely a feudal monarchy under a king supported by a nobility occupying palaces in a picturesque city full of mosques in point of fact cortez unwittingly was looking across an abyss of perhaps ten thousand years actually seeing the dead past live again to say remarks john fisk that it was like stepping back across the centuries to visit the nineveh of sennacherib or hundred gated thebes is but inadequately to depict the situation for it was a longer step than that yes immeasurably longer for it was a step from civilization quite to mid-barbarism what it really was that tenochtitlan disclosed to the spaniards may perhaps be best conceived by the aid of a survey from the summit of one of the so-called mosques the central valley of mexico is a plateau some seven thousand four hundred feet above sea level about sixty miles long by forty broad and surrounded by mountains here the waters collected by drainage as in a basin spread themselves out in three shallow lakes or lagoons of which chauco and zechimilico are fresh and tezcoco is salt covering in all perhaps four hundred and forty two square miles near the western side of lake tezcoco are two marsh islands and over them extends the community of mexico tenochtitlan with its adjunct tlatelolco this community which is not at all a city or municipality is of about one-fourth the extent of the mexico city of the present day and harbors at this early time a population of perhaps seventy thousand souls connection with the mainland is maintained by three long causeways one to the north one to the west and one to the south each twenty or twenty-five feet broad and of a cement construction which is hard and smooth these causeways provided as they are with sluice gates 
serve also as dikes for regulating the flow and depth of the water to the west of the islands where it discharges from chalco and zachimilico which are at a higher elevation than tezcoco for similar control to the eastward of the islands a long dike exists besides the three main causeways there are certain tributary ones and a double aqueduct of concrete bringing water from the mainland hill of chapultepec turning now our gaze more directly beneath we perceive first that the centre of the main community tenochtitlan is marked by a great square nine hundred by one thousand fifty feet facing the cardinal points and surrounded by a stone wall eight or nine feet high embellished with carved stone serpents in this wall on each side of the square there is a gate and each gate is approached from without by a broad avenue those leading to the north south and west gates being prolongations of the causeways by the square and avenues the main community is divided into four quarters the adjunct to la to la le co constituting a fifth division and each quarter is intersected by canals spanned by bridges the great square in tenochtitlan forms the place of trade and concourse and in tlatelalco a like square subserves the same so far as buildings are concerned they are of four principal sorts first huge communal dwellings next official edifices or tekpans then armories or houses of darts as they are called and lastly temple structures comprehending educational houses and quarters for priests the material of all is a reddish stone for the most part whitened to brilliance by stucco and the foundations as a rule are pyramidal in shape the great square is filled with temples twenty at least without counting the chief temple and tlatelalco also has its temples a chief and lesser ones if the hour of observation from our mosque be sunset the picture will be charming in the pale blue water sheet of tezcoco will be reflected not alone the white buildings of mexico tenochtitlan but those of other similar communities on the shores the whole relieved against a dark blue sierra crowned by the peaks gigantic and roseate of iztachihuatl white woman and popocatapetl smoking mountain on the other hand if we look at night charm will be replaced by an aspect weirdly sinister spectral barks or canoes fifty thousand of them it is said will be darting athwart the lake and through the brazier lighted canals while aloft the darkness will everywhere be pierced by temple flames a modern smelting works somewhat softened might suggest the effect open daylight however will best reveal mexico to notch titlan to the high-placed observer by it the communal dwellings will be seen to be of wide extent but of only one or at most two stories in the latter case receding or terraced and provided with low parapets the principal tekpans of which there are two one being in are surmounted by observation towers and the pyramids of the temples are bulky structures of smooth stone dented on one or more sides by steps and culminating in wooden oratories terrible indeed is the religion of the aztec nahua its leading deity is huitzilopochtli god of war and to him chiefly is consecrated the greatest pyramid of all it stands in the broad square of tenochtitlan it is three hundred feet wide on each side at the base and with its oratories it rises to a height of one hundred and fifty feet here under one's very nostrils as one gazes reeks the blood of human sacrifices blood offerings performed by filthy priests who in the curt phrase of bernal diaz stink like sulphur and have another bad smell like carrion 
a second great deity shares with the war god his ensanguined abode tezcatlipoca god of the breath of life the racial god of the nahua near by are the temples of two other important gods thalalak a god of rain and fertility and quetzalcoatl counterpart of the maya kukulkan god of order enlightenment and humaneness the blond and bearded god the fair god of romance but it is not merely the exteriors of houses that daylight in tenochtitlan best reveals interiors respond to it even more here will be seen courts supplied with ponds and fountains the abode in some instances of wild beasts and birds chambers with floors and walls brought to a hard finish by cement and gypsum and decked with featherwork hangings mats and cushions and provided with low canopied beds low tables and stools flint and copper implements and of varied pottery between many of the buildings too are green garden plots and in the lake floating vegetable gardens and in the squares both of tenoch titlan the and Tlatelolco, huge markets in full tide of activity of much interest is all this but obviously interest of a limited sort what of the inner self of the aztec what of his soul as disclosed by his religion the soul of the aztec is dark war feeds it and blood anoints it but art is a second medium of soul disclosure and through it the soul of the aztec is revealed as not inhospitable to light and beauty of aztec art featherwork is the most striking example but metalwork flower culture and poetry are also striking examples especially flower culture and poetry campoala is a place of roses mexico tenochtitlan is even more such a place roses peep above the parapets of the communal dwellings and tecpans bloom in the chinampas or floating gardens depending garlands from the breasts of idols no occasion is there that roses do not grace be it festival baptism wedding or funeral and though the form of arrangement be off that of the pyramid or the sacrificial mound beauty veils the tragedy of the suggestion when therefore the aztec poet dreams and sings it is flowers roses for the most part and other things of a flower-like fragility that he celebrates hummingbirds butterflies song-birds and precious stones i wonder where i may gather some pretty sweet flowers whom shall i ask suppose that i ask the brilliant hummingbird suppose that i ask the yellow butterfly they will tell me i polished my noble new song like a shining emerald i arranged it like the voice of the tezinitskan bird i set it in order like the chant of the zakwan bird i mingled it with the beauty of the emerald that i might make it appear like a rose bursting its bud they led me within a valley to a fertile spot a flowery spot where the dew spread out in glittering splendour where i saw lovely fragrant flowers lovely odorous flowers clothed with the dew but even amid songs of rejoicing rarely is there wanting the minor chord the plaintive strain common to primitive man weeping i the singer weave my songs of flowers of sadness i lift my voice in wailing i am afflicted as i remember that we must leave the beautiful flowers the noble songs only sad flowers and songs are here in mexico and tlatelalco ohuaya ohuaya the spaniard beholding mexico tenochtitlan with its adjunct tlatelalco failed to comprehend it and his failure save lately and in the case of a few persons has been our own the mexico city or municipality of the spaniard was in fact an indian pueblo it had been founded in thirteen hundred and twenty five by southward roving indians the aztecs a tribe few in number and near starvation 
finding the rich mexican valley already occupied the aztecs took as their portion the two neighboring islands in lake tezcoco and devoted themselves to their principal need the production of food chiefly maize and cocoa the tribe in process of time became fierce bloody and prosperous and it was the struggle for food that made them so this struggle for subsistence indeed is the key to aztec life and institutions to this struggle was it due that the inhabitants of tenochtitlan planted gardens and invented the floating garden to this was it due primarily that feeling the need of controlling communication with the mainland they built causeways which might be utilized as dikes to this was it due that feeling the need of a water supply and of an increased amount of food they mustered courage and conquered portions of the mainland nearest to them to this was it due that growing in population and power and needing yet more food they forced into existence a tripartite confederacy to levy contribution over an ever-widening area to this was it due that discovering the value of terror as a means of rule they developed the ancient maya nahua cult of human sacrifice at first practised infrequently into proportions at once colossal and revolting and made huitzil the god of war their local deity in chief the aztec tribe as an organism in embryo had but one head a sachem or cacique a civil leader in him seemingly were combined dual elements the above or masculine element and the below or feminine with expansion and conflict came a need of differentiation of attributes and there arose the war leader or chief of men the distinctly masculine element was now embodied in him the feminine being reserved to his associate who henceforth bore the title to many so puzzling of snake woman in the days of the spanish conquest the snake woman though often alluded to makes no particular figure the three overshadowing figures are chiefs of men montezuma quitlahuatzin and quatematzin of these montezuma is reflective and weak the other two his successors decisive and strong just here however our account of mexico tenochtitlan must cease for at the south causeway bowing stands cortez he has come with some four hundred men fifteen horses and seven light guns the route by which he travelled from the thirty first of august to the fifteenth of october has been from zocotlan southwest to tlascala a community independent of montezuma yet distrustful of the spaniard and from tlascala southwest to cholula from cholula in the valley or plain of huitzilipan the invaders have marched west to the mountain ridge connecting popocatapetla with its mate yetzacihuatla and from here early in november have surveyed the basin-like valley of mexico with mexico tenochtitlan afar off amid the waters of lake tezcoco they have then approached the border of lake chalco traversed a causeway leading to a peninsula itztapalapan and now in the community of itztapalapan itself stand days before the stonework the woodwork of cedar and other sweet scented trees the orchard and garden full of roses and fruit trees and the pond of fresh water with birds of many kinds and breeds to bernal diaz and his followers touched with the spirit of spanish romanticism the scene appears as the enchantments of the legend of amadis in the mind of montezuma meanwhile the grave question has been can these spaniards these strangers of the sunrise be gods when grillalva's expedition appeared off the coast in fifteen hundred and eighteen it had been reported to notch titlan that in the waters of heaven as the open sea was called 
floating towers had appeared from which had descended beings with white faces and hands with beards and long hair and wearing raiment of brilliant colours and round head coverings could these beings be priests or heralds of the fair god quetzalcoatla come according to the maya nahua tradition to resume sway over his people before proof could be adduced grill java had departed and then shortly had come swift messengers with news of cortez and with pictures of his floating towers and of his fair visaged yet bearded attendants handling the thunder and bestriding fierce creatures that spurned the ground proof regarding the quality of the fair strangers was required now more than ever and so the first embassy had been sent to cortez the embassy that had carried back as a specimen of the round heavy coverings of the strangers the gilt helmet this contrivance as it chanced resembled the head coverings of the aztec gods and especially of huitzilopochtli god of war so there had been sent to cortez the second embassy bringing the headdresses of quetzal feathers now these headdresses were those of the four principal gods of the aztecs tezcatlipoca god of the breath of life huitzilopochtli god of war Tlaloc, god of fertility and quetzalcoatl the fair or culture god what they seemingly were meant to signify to cortez was that montezuma tentatively at any rate was willing to acknowledge the former as like himself entitled to wear them as a representative of the gods nor was this all that the wonderful gifts of the second embassy were meant to signify among the gifts as will be remembered were two great wheels one of gold and one of silver all indians of america possess a social system more or less fully worked out from the heavenly spaces the four quarters or cardinal points of direction and the three regions above below and centre the four headdresses symbolizing the four principal gods may therefore be conceived as meant to stand to cortez for the four quarters and the gold and silver wheels respectively for the above and the below something of this kind almost certainly was symbolized by the gifts which besides being in the nature of a bribe to the spaniard as a human being to depart were likewise in the nature of a propitiatory offering to him as a god or at least a high priest to be merciful whether or not the spaniards really possessed preternatural attributes it has vastly puzzled all mexico to decide the Kempualans had industriously spread the idea that they did and one thing only had served to detract from the claim at tlascala where the matter had been put to a test some of the spanish horses those creatures of terror had been killed hacked apart and triumphantly devoured at feasts at cholula however cortez by the cleverness of marina had with unerring precision alighted upon an aztec plot to destroy him had as the marvelling chalulans expressed it read their very minds and thoughts and such power could pertain to gods alone but to come back to the spanish leader as he stands bowing at the south causeway outside of its palapan whether he be divine or human it has become apparent that his entry into tenochtitlan can no longer be prevented by gifts nor thwarted by guile montezuma therefore making a virtue of necessity is about to come forth to greet him not that machinations have ceased at all once the spaniards are beyond the drawbridges with retreat cut off once securely lodged in one of the principal tech-pans it is the purpose of the chief of men counsel thereto by the dire huitzilopochtli himself to destroy the invaders utterly and to send them in batches to the great pyramid as a savoury and acceptable blood offering the point where the ceremonies incident to the meeting of montezuma with cortez are to take place is on the south causeway at acachenanco a causeway junction and here a great crowd is gathered 
it would seem that not alone is tenochtitlan a settlement of four divisions but that aztec territory as such outside of tenochtitlan partakes of the same plan for at the causeway junction cortez is received by four aztec sub-chiefs from tezcoco itztapalapan tacuba and coahuacan settlements on the lake shore to the northeast southeast northwest and southwest respectively of tenochtitlan the lake is crowded with observers in canoes but the causeway itself the present calzada de itztapalapan is kept clear and down the vista which it forms rises mexico full of mystery the four sub-chiefs conduct the spaniards to the point where the south causeway merges in the south avenue the present street el rastro leading to the great square and here montezuma appears in person he comes reclining in a sumptuous litter borne upon the shoulders of attendants at sight of cortez he descends and there is spread above him a baldaquin of light greenish-blue feathers with fringe of gold pearls and jade he is a man about fifty-two years old tall slender and of dignified mien and his hair is worn short over the ears his garb is a robe of radiant blue and gold and his feet are shod with golden sandals is it as priest of huitzilopochtli that he thus presents himself to cortez the possible representative of that other deity the fair god quetzalcoatl waiting to dispossess him be that as it may the four sub-chiefs habited likewise in heavenly blue advance to his support dignitaries bearing tripartite wands symbolizing the authority of the confederacy go before him while attendants sweep clean the highway and even lay carpets that the golden sandals may not touch the ground as montezuma draws near cortez dismounts from his horse and steps forward montezuma kisses the earth an act performed by pressing it with the hand and then carrying the hand to the lips and offers to cortez how much of mexico is here a bunch of roses the spanish leader moves to salute montezuma by an embrace but is restrained by a gesture and instead places about his neck a necklace of beads taken from his own person throughout the ceremony the sides of the avenue are lined with attending sages all of whom are barefoot and to none of whom is it permitted to raise the eyes to montezuma the man of great medicine the high priest when the spaniards entered mexico it was november eighth fifteen hundred and nineteen between this date and the beginning of fifteen hundred and twenty cortez and his men found lodgings in the halls and chambers of the tecpan the official house or council lodge in the great square near the great temple formerly the quarters of montezuma himself but now vacated to accommodate the spaniards montezuma having taken up new quarters in one of the vast communal dwellings here cortez made himself secure by placing cannon to command the approaches and here he was received in audience by montezuma who causing him to be seated on a very rich platform in a chamber facing a court embellished with fountains and flowers addressed him thus we believe that our race was brought to these parts by a lord whose vassals they all were and to return to his native country and we have always believed that his descendants would come to subjugate this country and us as his vassals and according to the direction from which you say you come which is where the sun rises and from what you tell us of your great lord or king who has sent you here we believe and hold for certain that he is our rightful sovereign early fruits of the occupation of the tecpan by cortez were the discovery by accident of the walled-up storeroom containing the official treasure of the aztec government that aladdin's cave whence had come the gold and silver wheels the burning alive of certain aztec plotters and the seizure of the person of the chief of men who transferred to the tecpan became under castilian tutelage the tool and mouthpiece of his captor 
during fifteen hundred and twenty complications for the invaders arose cortez contrived the seizure of the war chiefs of tezcoco and tlacopan subheads of the aztec tripartite confederacy and of the war chiefs of coyahuacan and itztapalapan two of the four subheads of the aztec district itself then further he forbade human sacrifices by both these acts he stored up trouble for himself trouble furthermore developed independently from without diego velasquez governor of cuba and adelantado of the lands over which cortez was exercising sway had at length organized a strong expedition under panfilo de narvarez a man of hollow voice to assert his authority narvarez reached san juan de ulia in april and secretly got into relations with montezuma in order to check him cortez was compelled to divide his own small command leaving one hundred and forty men under pedro de alvarado and tenochtitlan he marched forth with ninety-two men in may and before the end of the month had near Kempuala met his foe defeated him and made him prisoner meanwhile in tenochtitlan alvarado impetuous by nature and roused by tales of conspiracy among the aztecs fostered by the coming of nar Baez set upon the population while engaged in celebrating the festival of the god tezcatlipoca and slaughtered them without discrimination and without ruth stunned by the onslaught but rallying promptly the mexicans fiercely assaulted the tecpan where the spaniards were housed and held them in a state of siege till cortez informed of their plight by secret messengers was able to return to their relief food was running short and montezuma being appealed to induce cortez to liberate the war chief of itztapalapan quitlahuatzin by name that he might calm the people and procure it this was the beginning of the end of the official character of montezuma quitlahuatzin was henceforth recognized by the clans as chief of men and led the mexicans in desperate attempts to force the spaniards out of tenochtitlan it was now late june and departure from the lake settlement became imperative for cortez in vain did the spaniards in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle drive the aztecs from the dizzy summit of the pyramid in the great square in vain did montezuma appeal to his countrymen from the roof of the tecpan the chief of men no longer such was reviled to his face nay more was assailed by missiles and stricken in the forehead within three days he was dead and on the fourth at midnight his erstwhile jailers stole silently from the tecpan into the avenue leading west to the tacuba causeway shortest of the three routes to the mainland and interrupted by the fewest sluice ways at first undetected they had nearly gained the causeway head when the night silence re-echoed to a cry the shriek of a native woman a signal drum on the pyramid in Tlatelolco at once boomed forth a warning and secrecy was at an end it was the noche triste the doleful night the bridges over the sluice ways were gone and could not be quickly replaced men horses and booty smitten in rear and flank filled the chasms in a tangled mass cortez himself got over by the greatest difficulty alvarado it is said cleared one of the chasms by an unparalleled vaulting leap Velasquez de leon and francisco de morla fell to emerge no more of the total force of spaniards one thousand two hundred and fifty men since the capture of nava as some four hundred and fifty were missing twenty-four horses survived the catastrophe but the significance of this fact was now small neither white stranger nor horse was any longer preternatural both were proven mortal both could perish cortez after all was not the fair god quetzalcoatl was not even his priest he was not divine in any sense just human just lustful a dissembling conqueror of flesh and blood once on the mainland the spaniards were able to stay somewhat the aztec pursuit and though as cortez expressed it without a horse that could run or a horseman who could lift an arm or a foot soldier 
who could move he finally managed to round lake tezcoco on the north and so after a fierce melee at otumba on the seventh of july to reach friendly and sheltering tlascala among the saved besides alvarado were gonzalo de sandoval cristobal de olid and the indispensable marina and aguilar the capture of tenochtitlan and the reduction of the aztecs to submission were still as much as ever the objects of cortez and he resumed the task sturdily in spite of his temporary check his forces he rested and augmented surrounding peoples he coerced or conciliated the road to vera cruz he put under guard disaffection in his own ranks due to the presence of so many of Navaez's men he quieted by soothing eloquence at length on the twenty eighth of december all was ready tezcoco was occupied and thirteen vessels shallow barges which after the manner of balboa in darien had been constructed in the forest were carried in pieces across the mountains and launched on tezcoco lake between march and may fifteen hundred and twenty one the spaniards seized its palapan and other points and during may and june cortez with nine hundred spaniards and thousands of native allies eighty-six horses and eighteen guns began a systematic siege of tenochtitlan by land and water many were the advances and repulses the aztecs resisted not alone with determination but with the utmost fury they cut the great dike they converted every canal into a moat they made of every house a castle taunts and challenges no less than missiles they flung across the water and down the converging avenues by night captive spaniards goaded to the top of the tlatelalco pyramid were spectacularly slaughtered in the glow of sacrificial fires spanish valor did much toward the reduction of the great community of the lake but famine and wholesale demolition of buildings did more and on the thirteenth of august the chief of men Quatematsin, doughty successor of quitlahuatzin who had died of smallpox before the siege surrendered in despair his own person and what remained of his nation so fell mexico tenochtitlan fortunate was it for cortez that in fifteen hundred nineteen it was montezuma who held in mexico the position of chief of men had it been otherwise had this position been held by quitlahuatzin or quatematsin it may be doubted whether the sun myth of the fair god and his impending return would have been permitted to paralyze action in a sense far from fanciful montezuma sicklied or with the pale cast of thought was the hamlet of the aztecs End of chapter four chapter five of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five spanish conquerors in central america gold 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 bright and yellow hard and cold hood miss kilmanseg balboa had fallen before pedrarius but the search for some passage-way to the provinces and islands of the south sea rich in spices pearls and gold was continued by not unworthy successors in the persons of andres nino a sea-dog not to be confounded with pero alonso nino pilot under columbus and oyeda and gil gonzalez davila columbus himself had sought this passageway or strait between fifteen hundred and two and fifteen hundred and four and others had followed him this nino too had explored the coast of darien in behalf of balboa in fifteen hundred and nineteen the year of balboa's death nino entered into a partnership with gil gonzalez treasury agent for espanola a man of great practicality and excellent judgment the partners were empowered by the crown to take over the ships built by balboa and to make exploration one thousand leagues to the west pedrarius seventy years old drier harder more inflexible than ever refused to deliver the vessels gonzalez whose rank in the partnership was that of captain-general thereupon dismantled his own ships 
and repeating the feat of balboa carried the materials over the mountains to the river balsas in the end after delays and discouragements comparable to those of balboa he managed to build and equip four small vessels and with them to sail westward on january twenty one fifteen hundred and twenty two this expedition which took a double form a coasting voyage by nino and a march overland by gonzales came first to the lands of the cacique nicoya from whom gonzales learned that fifty leagues to the northward there dwelt a greater cacique whose name was nicaragua gonzales abhorred strife as much as pedreras delighted in it and the naive wisdom of nicaragua had therefore a chance to unfold itself unhindered whence asked the cacique after listening to a detailed account of the mosaic scheme of creation did the sun and moon obtain their light and how would they lose it why did not the god of the christians make a better physical world one more comfortable to dwell in and finally speaking in the ear of the interpreter he asked came these men from the sky being assured that they did his next query was but how came they directly down like a spent arrow or riding a cloud or in a circuit like a bent bow the indian community over which nicaragua ruled was situated on a large fresh-water sea the present lake nicaragua and striding into it gonzales drank of the water and took possession in the name of the king of spain it is by situation he wrote barely three leagues from the south sea and according to the pilots connected with the north sea if so it is a great discovery here gonzales repelled an indian attack under a picturesque cacique named Dirianjan, and having satisfied himself that as yet the spaniards of mexico cortez and his followers had made no southerly advance returned to panama as for andres nino he had coasted as far northwestward as the bay of fonseca on the shores of the later central american provinces of salvador and honduras but what meanwhile of the doings of pedrarius it was in january fifteen hundred and nineteen that balboa had been got rid of and by the fifteenth of august pedrarius and espinosa gaspar de espinosa now captain-general of the south sea had crossed the isthmus from acla and had founded panama to serve as a southern terminal for the long contemplated chain of posts to connect the atlantic with the pacific side of the isthmus until the ardently desired interoceanic strait should be discovered later the same year a northern terminal was provided through the founding of nombre de dios with the rise of panama now created by royal decree a city and the capital of darien santa maria la antigua forever ill-famed as the place of execution of balboa sank rapidly to decay and in september fifteen hundred and twenty four was burned by the indians henceforth in the old tierra firma panama and nombre de dios are the names wherewith to conjure about these cities more than about any others of the indies does romance cling a wide road says peter martyr was built from one to the other through mountains overgrown with thick woods never touched from all eternity to the intent that two carts side by side might pass over with ease to search ye secrets of either spacious sea and ye secrets were searched well for at panama by the middle of the century not only did there ride at anchor ships from the south and far western east laden with the wealth of half a world but in the sun-beaten streets gold and silver lay stacked in bricks waiting along with spices and precious merchandise transportation to nombre de dios pedrarius had made headway also both to the west and east of his capital to the west as far as the nation of the chiroqui famed as potters he had sent 
espinosa and francisco pizarro the latter dutiful as ever to the south he had likewise sent a faithful retainer and honest man pasqual de andagoya who following the isthmus of darien to where it broadens into the continent of south america mundus novus became the explorer of biru whence very possibly the name peru and ultimately that of peru at any rate out of the andagoya expedition grew as we shall see the subsequent and ever memorable enterprise of pizarro pedrarius's next step was to send hernandez de cordoba to forestall gonzalez in the occupation of nicaragua a country claimed by him as within the confines of darien gonzalez appeared at panama just when pedrarius was prepared to appropriate his conquests and so balboa like had fairly thrust his head between the jaws of the lion but he was quick enough to withdraw it for he spread sail from nombre de dios as pedrarius rode up in hot haste to intercept him when gonzalez returned he approached nicaragua from the honduras coast he thus avoided pedrarius himself but encountered instead hernando de soto lieutenant to cordoba gonzalez defeated cordoba but only to succumb to the superior force of francisco de las casas one of cortez's lieutenants who carried him to mexico as a prisoner cordoba meantime thinking the occasion opportune sought to set up an independent government in nicaragua and honduras this act of treachery to pedrarius was reported to him at panama by de soto and in january fifteen hundred and twenty six pedrarius set sail for nicaragua in person with characteristic energy and ruthlessness he arrested cordoba put him to death and took control of the province the death of cordoba may be regarded as marking the end of the long-standing duel between pedrarius and the successors of balboa and its conclusion was not unfavourable to the swarthy souled governor upon pedrarius cunning indomitable vindictive fortune seemed ever to smile when for example in may fifteen hundred and twenty lopa de sosa came to antigua to supersede him in office that unhappy man was mortally stricken in the cabin of his ship as he prepared to disembark for his inauguration again when in fifteen hundred and twenty six the governor was recalled post haste to panama for trial just as he was on the point of seizing from cortez himself honduras as part of nicaragua what should befall but though superseded as to darien by pedro de los rios his authority over nicaragua was confirmed but the fact is not to be overlooked that he was ably and zealously seconded at court by his wife isabel de babadilla whom he had seasonably dispatched to spain with his pearls and gold the last years of his life despite the fact that they were the years of an octogenarian were active and marked by bloodshed on the caciques of the country who rose in revolt he wreaked diabolical vengeance by his bloodhounds but he had withal an eye for trade and transportation he projected a transcontinental route between lake nicaragua and the present greytown and afterwards one between leon and the north coast by way of salvador he became interested in the expedition of pizarro to peru but in this matter he for once suffered bafflement and died at leon in fifteen hundred and thirty as he was nearing his ninetieth year if the adventure of gil gonzalez to lake nicaragua in fifteen hundred and twenty two to twenty three was prompted by fear of southward encroachment by cortez cortez himself was not blind to the chance of northward encroachment by the spaniards of the isthmus in other words the conqueror of mexico and founder of new spain sought success also to the south and for two reasons there lay the districts of guatemala and honduras districts which it was said must far exceed mexico in riches while equalling her in the size of towns in the number of inhabitants and in culture 
and there in castilian fancy figured that long-sought interoceanic strait upon which every one counted to reach the vast pacific with its isles of mystery and gold if the spaniards had but known it guatemala held things more wonderful than gold or spices or even soft sensuous pearls for it had been the seat and centre of early maya culture centuries before and within its limits or just beyond lay the amazing ruins of tickle taranjo palenque and copan but for the sixteenth century spaniard archaeology did not exist his quest was still the same as that of columbus and Baheim, one still inspired by the lure of treasure to make the conquest of guatemala cortez chose pedro de alvarado alvarado of badajos whom we have already met was of good figure and engaging countenance he was athletic too and an excellent horseman and his hair and beard were red so red that the indians were tempted to think him quetzalcoatl the fair god and christened him the sun but though in a sense a good comrade alvarado was easily roused to anger and to brutal vengeance he left mexico city for guatemala on december sixth fifteen hundred and twenty three with one hundred and twenty horsemen three hundred foot soldiers a few pieces of artillery and a large body of mexicans the principal guatemalan tribes were in certain respects superior to the aztecs and comparable to the peruvians of their chief settlements utatlan was most celebrated massive official buildings religious and governmental grouped about a court made it rudely magnificent the subjugation of these people took the better part of two years during this time alvarado passed also into salvador here contrary to his expectation he failed to get news of an interoceanic strait to the southward but heard of distant cities built of stone and lime and densely populated an echo no doubt of quito and cuzco some months later alvarado was met by news of a startling character cortez it was declared had died not in mexico but on the way to honduras whither he was conducting an expedition if so who would be his successor it might well be alvarado and the conquistador at once made ready to repair to the seat of government in new spain cortez was soon discovered to be far from dead however for toward the close of fifteen hundred and twenty five alvarado received orders from him to repair straightway to honduras with all his forces vehemently declaring that all he possessed he owed to hernan cortez and that with him he would die alvarado obeyed but he learned on crossing the border that his master had changed his plans and had returned by sea to vera cruz whereupon in the midsummer of fifteen hundred and twenty six alvarado retraced his own steps to santiago of which he had been a founder but his venturesome spirit would not let him rest content with his single conquest comprehensive ideas had gripped him he felt the imperious lure of golden dreams he would go back to mexico after all he would see cortez secure his support and sail for spain there he would win sanction to adventure where the south beckoned he would be the man to complete the work of balboa but what of the expedition of cortez into honduras originally it had not been cortez's intention to make this expedition in person he had chosen for the task cristobal de olid a friend of alasquez governor of cuba a strong-limbed man and a very hector in fight but although olid sailed from vera cruz to honduras he had on the way at habana gone back to his allegiance to velasquez it had thereupon become necessary to send after the recreant a sleuth in the person of francisco de las casas at triunfo de la cruz just south of columbus's island of guanaya olid had captured las casas and also las casas's prisoner gil gonzalez but had afterwards been mortally stabbed by his captives as he sat with them at meat cortez had been unfaithful to velasquez olid had been unfaithful to cortez would las casas be any more faithful than olid had been such in the mind of the conqueror of mexico was now the question villain whom i have reared and trusted 
cortez had exclaimed on hearing of the treachery of olide by god and saint peter he shall rue it as for las casas it were well perhaps that he even have not too much the temptation of opportunity so late in october fifteen hundred and twenty four cortez set forth for the district of tabasco where he planned to cross the peninsula of yucatan then thought to be an island to the northern coast of honduras he took a force of about one hundred horsemen and forty foot soldiers together with pages musicians jugglers servants and some three thousand indians a unique feature was a body of aztec war chiefs and caciques from about lake tezcoco including quatzamatzin deposed chief of men of tenochtitlan these it had not been deemed prudent to leave in mexico in the absence of the conqueror at teotlac a point between istapan and lake patan cortez became convinced that the deposed chiefs and caciques in his train were plotting to overthrow him and to restore in mexico the aztec regime and he hanged two of them quatemotzin and the war chief of tlacopan to ceiba to a ciba tree at midnight thus was tragedy invoked but comedy did not range far behind on an island in lake patan was a fairly large indian settlement where cortez left a badly lamed horse the indians filled with veneration for the strange creature fed it on flowers and birds of which diet it speedily died they then worshipped it in effigy in one of their temples as a god of thunder and lightning a practice which was still maintained in sixteen hundred and fourteen the march to the southeast begun after the spanish mode with music and dancing quickly became a thing of dolor rivers forest-clad morasses lakes and labyrinthine sloughs seemed everywhere and when these at length ceased there supervened a flinty mountain pass which cost the lives of men and scores of horses to the south lay the ruins of palenque but they awakened no interest and it was five weary months before the exhausted band reached golfo dulque and the spanish town of nito at trujillo where cortez was planning yet further conquest disturbing news overtook him quarrels had broken out among members of the administrative board to which he had left the government and upon rumour of his death his property had been seized his presence was sorely needed to save his fortune and his conquests resolving to return he set out on april twenty five fifteen hundred and twenty six and reached vera cruz late in may so emaciated and broken in body as to be but a spectre of his former self in mexico city now a city in the true sense of the term cortez was welcomed with demonstrations of delight by spaniards and indians alike he was still to all beholders the spanish conquistador par excellence like columbus cortez was an object of much envy on both sides of the atlantic and to make clear his doings to the spanish king he took ship in fifteen hundred and twenty eight for spain he debarked at palos where he is said to have met pizarro and in his train by a freak of fate was pizarro's future brutus juan dorada charles v was at this time holding court at toledo and here cortez was met and escorted into his monarch's presence by a brilliant group of nobles needless to say he did not come empty-handed indeed by comparison with what he brought the offerings of columbus to ferdinand and isabella seemed mean and trivial first there was heaped treasure of gold and silver then feather-work and embroidery then specimens of arms and implements strange plants and animals and beautiful birds imposing indian chiefs among them a son of montezuma graced his retinue while amusement was contributed to the occasion by dwarfs albinos and human monstrosities cortez like columbus would have knelt at the royal feet but charles like ferdinand and isabella raised up the suppliant and compelled him to speak sitting and when illness overtook him the king personally visited him in his lodgings in spain the conqueror of mexico contracted a brilliant marriage catalina his first wife had already died and marina his indian mistress he had given as wife to one of his soldiers he received the title of marques del 
mexica marquis of the valley and was made a knight of santiago but amid these marks of royal favour misfortunes were not wanting his father had died and so had his beloved follower the youthful gonzalo de sandoval capping all he failed of his ambition to be made a duke a glory which he coveted beyond any other End of chapter five chapter six part one of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six pizarro and the incas he that has partners has masters pope sixtus v in the same year in which cortez started for honduras francisco pizarro set out for the viru country of andagoya under balboa on the shores of the gulf of san miguel he had heard of viru as the gateway to a country far to the south where the people were rich and used ships and beasts of burden and later under morales he had paid in this quarter a hasty and bloody visit pizarro native of trujillo in estremadura tall shapely sedate was at this time about fifty-three years old he undoubtedly was ambitious but he certainly was not inspired his strength lay not in initiative but in dogged persistence and endurance his conquest of peru was in certain respects heroic but it was not original his plans so to speak were barred ready finished from cortez pizarro had three coadjutors or partners diego de almagro an old friend and fellow rancher in the isthmus fernando de luca vicar of panama and pedrarius de villa the governor to the requirements of military command pizarro was equal but almagro was needed to superintend the dispatch of supplies and luca to play softly the part of intercessor with pedrarius none of the triumvirate was young in years but none had as yet won a fortune and as sir arthur helps sagely remarks the disappointed are ever young young in this sense and withal energetic pizarro amagro and luca certainly were for between mid-november in fifteen hundred and twenty four and the end of the year fifteen hundred and twenty eight they succeeded in demonstrating both the actuality and attainability of that golden peru which had been the objective of balboa in accomplishing this however never perhaps did men suffer more starting from panama with one vessel some eighty men and four horses pizarro touched at the pearl islands and stopped for six weeks at puerto de la hambra hunger harbor while the ship went back to the pearl islands for supplies meanwhile amagro had sailed from panama with a second ship and seventy men and had sought for pizarro as far as puerto de la hambra and the river san juan but the latter ere this had retraced his course to a spot in tierra firma called chicama and here amagro finally overtook him by this time both leaders had endured much amagro had lost an eye by an arrow and pizarro had nearly starved to death it was at this stage of affairs that pedrarius permitted himself to be outmanoeuvred he was preparing to enter nicaragua and was loath to spare men to pizarro and amagro in fact he was on the point of ordering the dutiful one back to panama for good so little did he perceive the glitter of gold in his direction when his purpose was stayed by the persuasiveness of luca and the resourcefulness of amagro though pizarro might not be intellectual and though of a surety he was unlettered he nevertheless was astute amid his own active misery and that of his men he was shrewd enough to keep personally beyond the reach of the governor at panama not for nothing had he served the latter all these years he knew his pedrarius so it was almagro and not pizarro who went to panama 
persuaded pedrarius for a consideration to relinquish his share in the enterprise to gaspar de espinosa and returned with two ships and with arms and supplies to resume the great adventure to the south the two leaders now had with them an unusual man one dexterous in his wit the pilot bartolome ruiz the trio with one hundred and sixty followers sailed to the river san juan and there separated almagro returned to panama for more men pizarro held the ground gained holding gains was ever a pizarro trait and ruiz navigated the coast of mundus novus to the southwest by this allotment of parts opportunity the spectacular chance was all with ruiz and he perceived his advantage pushing boldly to and beyond the equator the first navigator so to do in the pacific he rent the veil from before peru that is to say he discovered the island of gallo and bay of san mateo and coming upon a raft propelled by a latine sail and manned by indians he learned of tumbez and also of cuzco where ruled the inca and where there was vast golden treasure the crucial hour in the peruvian expedition came with the return of ruiz to the river san juan bringing tidings of what he had seen and heard and it was an hour exalted by the heroism of pizarro amagro had obtained about forty men in panama but it was realized that the peruvians were numerous and organized and that a strong force would be required to overcome them so back once more to panama went amagro there pedro de los rios governed in the stead of pedrarius but he was hardly more willing to supply men to pizarro and amagro than pedrarius had been for the men already with pizarro now withdrawn to the island of gallo had succeeded in making it known that they were being led to certain and probably futile death look out senor governor for the drover while he's near they wrote in characteristic spanish doggerel referring to almagro since he goes home to get the sheep for the butcher pizarro who stays here rios in fact insisted upon sending two ships in command of a jurist pedro tafur to bring home the men thus complaining still and here the value of luca in the partnership strongly appears the orders to tafur were not so drastic but that pizarro might proceed with the expedition with such men as chose to abide the issue on the island of gallo therefore pizarro upon the arrival of tafur assembled his men and put the situation squarely before them on the one hand lay peril with possible riches on the other safety with assured poverty the choice was theirs whether the spanish chieftain actually drew in the sand with the point of his sword a line to the south of which he dramatically bade those pass who would follow him is much to be doubted but in imposing upon his men an unequivocal choice he did something very like it at all events some sixteen men including ruiz the pilot pedro of candia a greek and an unnamed negro stepped to his side and with this little company pizarro crossed from gallo to the smaller but more easily defended island of gorgona to await the coming of amagro preparatory to advancing toward tumbez on little gorgona in a cloud-curtained sea near a fearfully fascinating shore for seven months he waited starving the topography of primitive mexico was impressive enough a low-lying atlantic seaboard a gradual rise through tropical vegetation and life to a plateau seventy four hundred feet above sea level guarding this plateau a mountain wall accentuated by twin volcanic peaks seventeen thousand feet high and within the wall covering the plateau in considerable part a cluster of lakes fresh and salt but magnificent as was the mexican scenery in peru nature overpassing the impressive became stupendous and sublime 
the peru of the incas at the coming of pizarro stretched along the pacific coast of south america from the river and Casmayu, north of quito in ecuador to the river mala below santiago in chile a region some twenty seven hundred miles in length and comprehending the modern state of ecuador peru and bolivia with part of chile and argentina its main features within the limits of peru proper the peru of to-day were an arid ocean strand less than one hundred miles in breadth a double at times treble cordillera or mountain chain the andes from one to two hundred miles in breadth and a district of tropical forest conserving the sources of the amazon to these features should be added the antarctic or humboldt current flowing up the western shore a current so cold as to shroud the coast in mists and infuse a chill through even the tropics the mere walls of the andes at their ordinary elevation attain fourteen thousand feet and more then there were giant peaks ranging between seventeen and twenty two thousand feet and on the verge of the inca dominion aconcagua chief of the andean giants to which nearly twenty three thousand feet must be assigned mere altitude however was not in peru the engrossing element in the sublime that element was aloofness a weird and stern inhumanity to which all observers have borne witness savage solitudes sombre grandeur strange weirdness awe-inspiring vastness solemn immensity a wasteland where no man goes or hath gone since the making of the world such are the words of description used but the grim topography of ancient peru had its redeeming feature sunlight first on the mountain tops and then on the surface of lake titicaca the lake to-day about the size of lake erie but in places some six or seven hundred feet deep very irregular in shape and studded with islands lay within the plateau of peru and bolivia at an elevation of about thirteen thousand feet the largest body of fresh water in the world at so great an elevation the light of the sun in the titicaca valley gave rise in the course of ages to the barbarism or semi-civilization of the inca mode of life but far earlier it gave rise to the peruvian stage of development in the megalithic or great stone period the sun to quote a peruvian writer of inca descent placed his children near the lake of titicaca how long after the stone age the age of the incas came is a question several centuries no doubt suffice it to say that the megalithic folk were one day overthrown by invaders from the south and the remnant of them took refuge as is now conjectured in an inaccessible canyon in the valley of the urubamba river northwest of the site of cuzco here at tampu taco machu picchu a city peering thousands of feet down upon roaring rapids the incas were bred and in due time somewhere about the twelfth century became strong enough to leave their fastness retake possession of the titicaca region and begin that movement of conquest and organization which with cuzco as a centre resulted in an empire vaster than was ruled from moscow or aix la chapelle from baghdad or granada at the coming of pizarro the distinctive features of peruvian culture features wherein it differed palpably from the culture of the aztecs were two centralized authority in government and monotheism in religion the peruvians quinchua tribes were a far less hardy race than the aztecs yet despite their softness they achieved things which the aztecs failed to accomplish in a sense they were the asiatics of america both actively and passively they gave evidence of an aptitude for despotic statecraft unlike the aztecs they ruled conquered tribes by direct interposition through governors and garrisons by imposing their own language quichua and by the establishment of military highways 
when cortez invaded mexico aztec authority an authority limited to the levying of tribute was respected throughout an area about the size of the state of massachusetts when pizarro invaded peru inca authority was much better respected throughout an area about equal to that of the united states east of the mississippi river in a word by the time when pizarro arrived the peruvians had largely passed out of the clan stage of development into the national stage particularism or localism with its delegated and revocable leadership within the tribe and its leadership by confederation as between tribes had given way to incipient monarchy the peruvian religion like the religion of old persia centred in the worship of the sun and forsooth what more natural than that the orb to which in peculiar measure the culture of peru owed its existence should become the chief object of the adoration of the peruvian tribesmen the dawn was it not birth to him the midday splendor was it not power to him the sunset typified it not death to him the inca himself was sun begotten and being so bore divine attributes no indian official in north america or in south in florida in mexico or in mundus novus could compare in rank with the inca politically a king and religiously a god centralization of governmental authority in peru is decisively shown by the social organization which prevailed the primary unit was the family of five persons and thence greater units were derived by multiplying by ten until there was obtained the ultimate unit of fifty thousand the head of which was directly responsible to the inca clanship however though outgrown politically survived economically for land belonged to the local community and not to the family or individual in agriculture the peruvians were adept they produced the finest of cotton and grew excellent maize and potatoes they made use of the vicuna and the alpaca as sources of the finest wool but like all things peruvian farming was rigidly supervised and controlled from cuzco the produce being divided into three equal parts whereof two went to the state and one only to the producer countless were the ways in which inca rule made itself felt everybody was enumerated everybody must dwell in a fixed district and follow a fixed occupation and in order that the multitude of tribes incorporated into the nation might readily be distinguished each tribe must use a distinctive dress and method of wearing the hair caste too was universal below the inca and constituting a nobility were lords priests warriors and civil governors and below the nobility constituting commoners were shepherds of llamas hunters farmers and artificers the softness which characterized the peruvians physically characterized them also intellectually they excelled in the arts in pottery in weaving and in the fashioning of gold silver and bronze literature they produced in the form of dramas love songs and hymns of worship of worship at times of something more universal than the sun o oh, hear me from the sky above in which thou mayest be from the sea beneath in which thou mayest be creator of the world maker of all men but they evolved no system of writing not even a pictographic one using only knotted and twisted cords called quippus to perpetuate their thoughts at the time of the spanish conquest of america there was more promise for the future in the hellenic like barbarism plastic though crude of the aztecs than in the asiatic like barbarism rigid though polished of the peruvians but what of francisco pizarro pedro de candia and the others of pizarro's band whom we left facing starvation on the little island of gorgona off the coast of ecuador and awaiting the coming of almagro from panama with reinforcements ruiz the pilot was not with them for he had returned north with tafur at the end of seven months however he came in almagro's stead and the company set out as pizarro had planned for tumbes which is situated on the gulf later called guayaquil their course took them past cape Pasado, the limit of ruiz's exploratory voyage past the volcanic peaks of cotopaxi and chimborazo and in twenty days they reached tumbes 
here pizarro sent ashore parties under pedro de candia and others the messengers were greeted as superior beings very much as cortez and his followers were greeted at san juan de ulia their faces were fair they wore long beards and their identity as children of the light that light which in peru meant so much was considered established with them however on one occasion went the negro and to fit him into satisfactory relations with the emissaries of the dawn was found difficult they tried washing but to no effect and the peruvians were obliged to accept him for what he was one not to be understood but simply to be enjoyed the report of pizarro's messengers as to what was to be seen at tumbes a fortress a temple comely virgins of the sun vases of gold abundantly confirmed the earlier report of ruiz but pizarro had few men the new government at panama had seen to that and he resolved to betake himself directly to spain to lay his discovery before the king there he arrived early in fifteen hundred and twenty eight accompanied by the greek pedro de candia by the twenty sixth of july at toledo he had met charles v who created him governor of all he might discover for a distance of two hundred leagues to the south of santiago a river entering the sea just below the latitude of the island of gallo the king made amago and luca the captain and the bishop of tumbes bartolome ruiz grand pilot of the south sea pedro de candia chief of artillery and the heroes of the isle of gorgona knights and cavaliers from toledo pizarro went to trujillo his native town and drew to his support his brothers hernando juan gonzalo and martin of alcantara all capable all brave and all except the first described as like pizarro himself illegitimate poor ignorant and avaricious the proposed expedition to peru unlike the expeditions of prior spanish adventurers did not attract followers and it was with only one hundred and eighty men and thirty horses that in december fifteen hundred and thirty one a year after his return from spain the estra maduran was able to set sail with three ships from panama for tumbes in the peruvian conquest there may be said to have been three definite stages one of waiting and preparation one of active hostilities and one of accomplishment the stage of waiting and preparation of patience and endurance has already been glanced at here pizarro shone from the days when under o Yeda, balboa and pedrarius he had served on the terrible isthmus to those when he challenged riches and renown on the hardly less terrible coast of peru there was nothing that he did not suffer at san juan river toils of the jungle within reach of the hideous dangling boa and of the stealthy alligator on the island of gallo nauseating food thunder lightning and torrential rain on gorgona plague of insects incessant intolerable inescapable all these things with starvation often added pizarro suffered but though in distress he did not repine but bravely endured tumbes he reached in the spring of fifteen hundred and thirty two and here the invaders were joined by hernando de soto with one hundred men and fifty horses from nicaragua thus reinforced pizarro as a means of establishing himself in the country he had set out to despoil and convert resolved to found a town choosing a site near the sea some thirty leagues to the south of tumbes he founded san miguel the first european settlement in the domain ruled by the incas having secured a base the next step was to locate and appraise the forces of opposition he accordingly sent de soto with a party of horse along the foot of the first of the several great chains of the andes to gather information what pizarro learned was that in peru there was at that time a legitimate ruler named cuzco son of old cuzco and that he had a brother atahualpa who was in rebellion but to whom fortune had been so far favourable that he had defeated young cuzco and gone on conquering the land southward to a place called caxamarca caxamarca pizarro learned was beyond the mountain wall which confronted him but at a distance of only twelve or fifteen days march traditionally the first inca of peru was manco cacapac who flourished about one thousand one hundred and built or rebuilt the town of cuzco historically however the first inca was viracocha 
whose reign fell somewhere about thirteen hundred and eighty in fifteen hundred the inca was huena cacapac the old cuzco of pizarro's informants and under him it was that the inca dominion was projected northward beyond quito and southward into chile huena cacapac old cuzco was succeeded by his legitimate son huascar young cuzco but huascar had a brother atahualpa son of hueno by a concubine daughter of the last independent ruler of quito and in order to secure to him a share in the succession hueno at his death divided the royal possessions assigning to atahualpa the quito inheritance and to huascar the remainder the results usual under such circumstances followed strife between the brothers arose and in the contest not only had atahualpa triumphed but he had succeeded in making huascar captive as between pizarro and atahualpa the situation was quite like that which a dozen years before had obtained between cortez and montezuma in both instances invaders believed to be engendered of the sea or dropped from the sky sought from a seaboard base to overcome rulers established in the mountains as protectors of capitals which were believed to be the repositories of untold wealth there were however certain differences the way to atahualpa barred as it was by the mighty outer wall of the andes was more difficult than the way to montezuma but offsetting this cortez's advance was hindered by every subtlest art of indian subterfuge while that of pizarro was uninterfered with then again montezuma had as he thought laid for cortez a trap in mexico tenochtitlan itself whereas atahualpa for aught that appears received pizarro at caxamarca with such sublime faith in his own abounding resources that he felt for him little other than contempt but let the narrative disclose its own tale it was in september that pizarro set out from san miguel his force was, was in all one hundred and seventy-seven men sixty-seven of whom were horsemen at first the country was comparatively level watered by mountain-fed aqueducts and set with orchards and fields of waving grain withal the air was sweet with the breath of flowers and the people were friendly but the soldiers some of them showed discontent and to meet it pizarro promptly sent back to san miguel nine men who lacked heart for the great enterprise cortez under more trying circumstances had dealt with disaffection by scuttling his ships and by meeting out drastic punishments yet to the men of cortez the evidence of riches ahead was far stronger than to the men of pizarro for the latter had beheld naught to compare with the gold and silver wheels presented to cortez by montezuma to pizarro therefore relieved of his disaffected element but facing mountains and with no treasure in sight it remained to urge forward his command by appealing to their piety their sense of duty as propagandists of the faith besides being primitive proud and romantic the spaniard it will be recalled was devout devoutness indeed as a spur to action held with him a place second only to avarice pizarro's chief obstacle was the andes with their crests of snow glittering high in the heavens such a wild chaos of magnificence and beauty as no other mountain scenery in the world could show up this barrier struggled foot soldiers and horsemen the latter dismounted and tugging at their beasts here the path hugged the base of a toppling cliff there it shunned a reeling abyss while ever above the crawling spanish line hung greedy for mishap that obscene bird of carrion the peruvian condor near the summit of the range the invaders came upon one of the military roads of the incas a road which connected cuzco with quito and which in point of length has been likened to a conceivable highway connecting calais with constantinople it was a road however upon which no wheel turned for unlike the early chaldeans babylonians and egyptians the peruvians with whom everything stopped short were unacquainted with the principle of the wheel on this journey upward to caxamarca this new world anabasis pizarro was met and waited upon as cortez had been on his journey by successive embassies one came under the escort of de soto whom the spanish leader had sent to reconnoitre and met pizarro at the foot of the range while the others whereof there were two met him near the summit all brought gifts the first an elaborate drinking-cup of stone woollen stuffs embroidered in gold and silver and perfume 
the second several llamas and the third peruvian sheep chica or fermented juice of the maize to employ a delicate periphrasis and what to the spaniards was more to the point golden goblets from which to quaff this beverage mid-november was now at hand and pizarro had bested his great obstacle he had scaled the andes beneath him spread a valley stream traversed and highly cultivated and in this valley he described three things the town of caxamarca steam rising from hot mineral springs and did his pulse quicken a white cloud of pavilions covering the ground as thick as snowflakes pizarro entered caxamarca on the fifteenth of november at the hour of vespers his first act was to send de soto with twenty horsemen to announce to atahualpa his arrival and his second to send his brother hernando after de soto with twenty more horsemen as a reinforcement the inca a man of thirty sat at the door of his tent cross-legged on a low cushion surrounded by male and female attendants he wore a tunic and robe but what distinguished him as a ruler was the headdress the borla this consisted of a fringed cord of red vicuna wool wound several times around the head the fringe depending over the eyes as lord of both quito and cuzco and especially of quito through his mother atahapa would no doubt have felt himself entitled to wear as later he did wear the insignia of quito a string of royal emeralds seated on his cushion the inca held his eyes fixed upon the ground nor did he raise them or otherwise respond when hernando pizarro with grave spanish mien invited him to visit his brother in the town his thoughts what were they in all probability the question in the mind of montezuma in the case of cortez were these newcomers gods it was the horse as we have seen that more than aught else in indian eyes gave to the spaniard the seeming of a god atahualpa had kept himself informed regarding this weird creature and in a measure was fortified against the terror of him through messengers from the quito country he had learned that the spaniard and his horse were not all one animal for on the coast a rider had been observed to fall from a horse confirming this idea of the separability of horse and rider had come news that at night the horses were unsaddled nor was the horse immortal for a cacique of the neighbourhood of san miguel had sent word that he personally had killed one glancing up at length from his reverie atahualpa said to hernando pizarro that the spaniards could be no great warriors for the san miguel curaca cacique had killed three besides a horse nettled at this speech so weighed and measured in its audacity hernando pizarro replied that one horse let alone riders could conquer the whole country and as if practically to substantiate the claim de soto the best mounted man in the spanish group struck spurs into his steed dashed across the plain and wheeling in graceful circles reined in the animal so close to the inca that foam from his sides bespattered the royal garments but atahualpa self-schooled against terror of the horse did not flinch to him evidently the spaniards if gods at all were not formidable ones and when he consented as now he did to visit pizarro in camp the next day it was as the chronicle has it with the smile of a man who did not very much esteem us that night the spaniards knew fear the twinkling distant camp-fires of the peruvian host fires likened in multitude to the stars of heaven impressed them with a sense of their numerical inferiority and again pizarro found it expedient to warm their zeal and stiffen their courage by appealing to them as sons of the church and propagandists of the faith as for pizarro himself he had a plan which had been long in his mind he would seize the person of atahualpa even as cortez had seized the person of montezuma and all would be well the town of caxamarca itself was not large its distinguishing feature however was an extensive triangular plaza larger than any plaza in spain enclosed on two sides by long low buildings these buildings may have been communal dwellings for they are spoken of as divided on the interior into blocks each block comprising a suite of rooms if the buildings in question were communal they served to illustrate peruvian nation-making as in this quarter something yet in process the clan here not having been superseded by the family but there were other buildings survivals of the early medicine lodge and council lodge temples and great halls all very much as in mexico tenochtitlan 
of the great halls there were three each giving through a wide opening upon the plaza in one pizarro stationed a squadron of horsemen under hernando pizarro in another a squadron under de soto and in a third a squadron under a doughty cavalier newly arrived sebastian de benalcazar the foot soldiers as a body he placed in concealment round about but twenty such picked for their prowess he attached to his own person taking with them a central station well concealed whence he could sally forth in any direction pedro de candia be it added trained upon the plaza from a fortress above it the artillery of the invaders two falconets such was the disposition of the spanish leaders when about noon of the sixteenth of november atahualpa emerged from his camp on his way to visit pizarro in coxamarca the lion in his lair he was attended by thousands and the spectacle offered was that of montezuma advancing to meet cortez but when within a short distance of the town what should the peruvian monarch do but stop the progress and prepare to pitch his tents this pizarro saw with dismay for his men long kept at high tension must speedily find relief in action or succumb to fear he accordingly dispatched an earnest request to atahualpa that he resume the march and entered the town that evening where every arrangement for his reception and entertainment had been made the inca granted this request and just before sunset the child of the sun passed the gates in front as with montezuma came runners clearing the way of dirt and obstructions and singing sonorous songs songs pronounced hellish in the chronicle then came dancers then caciques of divers grades bearing hammers of silver or copper and conspicuous for checkered or white liveries those immediately about the inca were caciques or noblemen of special dignity wearing head-dresses ornamented with gold and silver breast armor of gold plates and great ear studs all more or less seemed to have been distinguished by vestments of blue that azure azul or sky color so marked and evidently so significant in the apparel of montezuma the inca himself like the chief of men was borne aloft in a litter he sat on a throne of gold within a baraquin lined with the brilliant plumage of the parakeet and covered with gold and silver plates a man of vigor large with bold eyes somewhat bloodshot his aspect was commanding and even fierce as lord of quito he wore the royal emeralds as child of the sun he wore the borla and in addition a golden diadem garnished with the wing feathers of the caraquenqua it was his right moreover to be preceded by a standard-bearer carrying a banner emblazoned with the rainbow in any event he was an impressive figure as dividing to the right and left his numerous escort fell away leaving him alone the observed of all observers in the plaza no spaniard was in sight and atahualpa was perplexed what has become of these fellows he demanded with impatience hereupon pizarro sent forth to meet the indian ruler and to account to him for the presence of the spaniards in his country the priest and spiritual leader of the expedition vincente de valverde later bishop of cuzco valverde of course could speak to atahualpa only through the interpreter a young indian captured at tumbes named philippillo or little philip who was for the purpose of feeble dependence in no sense a second marina or aguilar what father valverde undertook to impress upon atahualpa was that there was one true god and that he had sent to earth his son jesus christ the christ being put to death had left his power in the hands of saint peter who dying had passed it on to the popes of rome one of the popes the one now alive had heard that the indians of the world instead of worshipping the true god adored idols and likenesses of the devil thereupon he had given it into the hands of charles king of spain and monarch of the whole earth to conquer the indian nations and bring them to the knowledge of god and the obedience of the church to effect this conquest charles had commissioned don francisco pizarro now here if thou shalt deny and refuse to obey fervently exclaimed the priest know that thou shalt be persecuted with fire and sword without mercy what atahualpa probably gathered out of this harangue as rendered in what has been called the deplorable cuscan of filipillo was that a distant mysterious lord a white stranger's lord operating as the agent of a mysterious deity or of several such for the trinity had figured in the discourse claimed his allegiance and tribute and meant to deprive him and the people of independence 
fear of the spaniards as themselves gods or at least preternatural beings does not seem to have much dwelt in the mind of the inca for observing that father valverde held in his hand a book the bible whence he had derived the matter of his exhortation at huapa demanded to see it it was clasped and the indian was unable to open it the priest stepped to the side of the litter to give help but atahuapa resenting the intrusion forced the claps back ran his eyes helplessly through the leaves and cast the holy volume violently upon the ground End of chapter six part one chapter six part two of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six part two pizarro and the incas not only did the inca spurn the word of god but he at the same time said that he knew how the spaniards had maltreated his people all the way from tumbez even to burning some of them alive and that he required reparation here then was defiance complete defiance of all the powers of the powers temporal as well as those spiritual of emperor and of francisco pizarro as well as of god christ st peter and the pope and punishment was called for the hour the moment had come on hearing father valverde's report pizarro informed his brother hernando the latter in turn informed pedro de candia who discharged his falconets the signal agreed upon and the horsemen everywhere burst from cover in advance of all sword in hand and shouting santiago ran pizarro his object was the royal litter but ere he could reach it the attendants of atahualpa had interposed themselves and there ensued a furious melee in the end amid great slaughter the litter was overturned and atahualpa the god descended his robes in tatters diadem and borla torn from his brow was dragged forth a captive montezuma fell before cortez a victim of vacillation the result of timidity bred of superstition atahualpa fell before pizarro a victim of assurance which was the result of arrogance entering caxamarca late in the day atahualpa had notified pizarro that he would spend the night within its gates but with only a fraction of his forces and these unarmed what need forsooth of arms of copper-pointed spears of bows and arrows and of lassos had atahualpa was he not inca was he not literally child of the sun your god he is said to have boasted to father valverde was you say slain by men the work of his hands my god pointing proudly to the sinking sun dies but to live again that november evening fifteen hundred and thirty two pizarro and atahualpa supped together breaking bread with the defeated seems to have been an amiable if somewhat ironical spanish custom whether those so honoured were themselves spaniards or not cristobal de olid had supped with his prisoners gil gonzalez and francisco de las casas but only to have his hospitality requited by slashes at his throat in the case of at to hualpa such requital was not to be apprehended the inca was too dazed to think of trying it himself and his followers were too profoundly overawed but dazed though out hualpa was he did not so remain on the morrow after his overthrow he noticed that while the spaniards brought in as booty many bales of beautifully woven woollen and cotton fabrics the things which as booty they esteemed most were the royal utensils of gold and silver if it were gold and silver the white strangers coveted he personally much preferred glass these metals abounded in peru why not purchase with them his own freedom freedom was valuable to him just then for the legitimate inca huascar his brother was himself a captive 
and when the latter should learn of the captivity of atahualpa what plots plots even with the invaders might he not concoct against him one day therefore as he and pizarro stood in a chamber of pizarro's quarters he suddenly offered to cover the floor with gold if his freedom were granted the offer provoked only a smile and atahualpa was piqued he stepped proudly to the wall and indicating a point thereon as high as he could reach offered to fill the entire room to that point with gold he also offered to fill a smaller room adjoining twice over with silver the only conditions he made were that the metal should not first be melted down but should retain the form of the objects into which they had been wrought and that he should have two months within which to fulfil his undertaking then ensued one of the most wonderful episodes in history each day there went forth from the presence of atahualpa couriers to the four quarters of the empire and ere long in answer porters began to appear bearing all manner of gold and silver objects jars vases ewers salvers and goblets from the temples to say naught of hammered golden sheets an occasional throne pedestal or sun they brought two wonderful things from the official dwellings the palaces of the inca such for example as fountains designed to emit sparkling jets of gold miniature gold birds and beasts trees also plants with leaves flowers and fruit fields of maize with leaves heads canes roots and flowers and flowers of the field with petals stems and leaves so gleaming indeed were the long files of porters under their golden packs that as beheld afar they seemed veritable threads of gold caught from point to point across the landscape a circumstance which helped materially in collecting the treasure was that hernando pizarro and hernando de soto had conceived for atahualpa a genuine liking a suite of rooms was assigned him and within these he maintained his customary state here he amused himself with his concubines here with great animation and skill he played dice and chess games learned from his conquerors and here he received his vassals in audience none of whom however great presumed to enter before him without first removing his sandals and placing a burden on his back the point to which atahualpa had agreed to fill pizarro's chamber with gold was some nine feet from the floor and the floor dimensions were about seventeen by twenty-two feet as this space of over three thousand cubic feet began to gradually lessen under the heaps and piles of gold thrown into it did francisco pizarro reflect twenty years before first in comogra's country when on the peak in darien and finally on the shores of the gulf of san miguel he a dutiful lieutenant to balboa had heard intimations of peru of peru the golden somewhere to the south since then balboa had forfeited his head and he alone had found peru had columbus found it or Baheim, or alonzo pinzon how each would have wrestled with geography to prove that he had found if not cathay and sipangu at least india at least the golden cheronese columbus on his fourth voyage would have seen in peru capping the stem of the earth as from its altitude it might well have been thought to do the earthly paradise and to cordes had he found it it would have answered more even than did mexico to the requirements of that land when solomon is said to have brought the gold for the temple it took longer to fill pizarro's chamber with gold up to the nine-foot point than atahualpa had counted on for as the drain became severe the public guardians especially in the temples began to secrete their treasures at length pizarro waxing highly impatient atahualpa who too was impatient proposed that the former send out collectors of his own they might go to pachacamac puru's shrine to an unknown god very ancient and very rich or they might go directly to cuzco where more than anywhere else the gold and silver of the inca government was massed and at either place they might help themselves they went to both places and what they brought back was from pachacamac twenty-seven loads cargas 
of gold and two thousand marks of silver and from cuzco two hundred loads of gold and twenty-five loads of silver a load three hundred and thirty-three pounds was what could be carried by four indians and as part of several such loads from cuzco there were brought seven hundred gold plates stripped from the temple of the sun each plate being ten or twelve inches wide and weighing from four to twelve pounds it was now june fifteen hundred and thirty three and although the nine foot level in pizarro's chamber was not yet quite attained it was deemed expedient to melt down the collection and value it preparatory to a division so valued it reached a total of one million three hundred and twenty six thousand five hundred and thirty nine pesos de oro or counting the purchasing power of a peso as eleven dollars and sixty seven cents nearly fifteen million five hundred thousand dollars in american money nor did this include the silver of the smaller chamber which was estimated at fifty one thousand six hundred and ten marks no such treasure had ever before been amassed by a conqueror so gigantic was it so staggering that had bizarro sought for it a parallel he must needs have betaken himself not to marco polo's east or that of ibn batuta but to the east of the arabian nights entertainments the genie so runs a familiar tale returned with forty black slaves each bearing on his head a heavy tray of pure gold each tray was covered with silver tissue embroidered with flowers of gold the genie disappeared but presently returned with the forty slaves ten of whom carried each a purse containing a thousand pieces of gold but most of all to be coveted were four large buffets profusely furnished with large flagons basins and cups all of massy gold so was it with aladdin and so without hyperbole was it with pizarro desiring to impress his king with the wealth of peru that peru which he alone had conquered pizarro in the same year in which he melted down his treasure sent to spain his brother hernando with the fifth portion belonging to the crown and with half a million pesos de oro besides the custom-house at seville it is said overflowed with solid ingots not to mention vases animals flowers and fountains all of pure gold the populace were dazed the court aghast for successful adventurers were not loved at court and the king delighted cortez had created a flurry with his wheels of gold and silver sent home in fifteen hundred nineteen and had all of his gleanings from montezuma been got together in one place and at one time they would have made an enduring impression but for the most part spain never saw them for they were either captured by francis i of france or lost during the noche triste when cortez and pizarro met at palos in fifteen hundred and twenty eight the cry in spain was all cortez and mexico after the coming of hernando pizarro to seville in fifteen hundred and thirty four the tables were completely turned the cry then and ever after as long as cortez and pizarro lived was pizarro and peru but to go back a little it was midsummer fifteen hundred and thirty three and pizarro had decided to march to cuzco his real objective since the day when bartolome ruiz had heard of it and its splendor from the indians on the raft off tumbez seven full months had he lingered at caxamarca and all the gold that could be gathered there he had obtained besides almagro was again in peru he had landed late in december fifteen hundred and thirty two with three ships piloted by ruiz and with a force consisting of one hundred and fifty foot soldiers and fifty horsemen pizarro was glad of the reinforcement whether he was glad of the personal presence of almagro is not so certain almagro was pizarro's partner his only active partner for luca was now dead and to apply the motto of the present chapter he that has partners has masters if amagra was pizarro's master this was a relationship for the future to disclose up to the present amagra's only recompense for toil and a lost eye had been the captaincy of tumbez whatever that might import and against pizarro his soul was bitter 
nor was the news which greeted him at san miguel whither he came from tumbez of a sort to appease pizarro had scaled the andes had seized the inca of peru and from the latter was exacting an enormous ransom in these momentous transactions where did amagro pizarro's partner figure did he figure at all the amagro determined to see with his men he too scaled the andes and in february fifteen hundred and thirty three was at caxa marca hence pizarro's decision to march to cuzco for not only had he exhausted the gold to be obtained at caxa marca but in order to meet the expectations and demands of his followers now by amagro's arrival quite doubled in number he needed yet more gold of the fifteen and one half million dollars in pizarro's hands as revealed by the melting down and weighing of his main treasure amalgro's company would seem to have been quieted with some two hundred and thirty three thousand dollars their harvest it was explained to them awaited them in cuzco what amalgro himself consented to receive is nowhere told to pizarro and his men as those by whom thus far the conquest had actually been achieved there fell immense sums to bizarre himself nearly seven hundred thousand dollars to say nothing of two thousand three hundred marks of silver to hernando pizarro nearly three hundred and sixty three thousand dollars without counting silver to de soto two hundred and seventy thousand dollars not counting silver to each horseman one hundred and three thousand dollars and to the foot soldiers the most meritorious of them nearly fifty two thousand dollars each and now on every hand and especially from amagro's contingent the cry arose on to cuzco but said pizarro wait what about atahualpa the indian monarch had in substance if not in letter kept his word regarding his ransom and was now demanding freedom should freedom be given him early in his captivity the news that he was paying vast sums to pizarro as a ransom had come to the ears of the legitimate inca who was in captivity near cuzco and huascar proceeding to do what atahualpa had surmised he might had surreptitiously entered into relations with the spaniards and offered a greater ransom for freedom than the ransom offered by atahualpa what a situation was here and how completely to the spanish advantage it admitted the playing off of one hostile element against another and a spaniard like cortez would have triumphed by it but pizarro was not cortez what he did was to leave huascar in atahualpa's power and at the same time incautiously let it be known to atahualpa that huascar was outbidding him the natural result followed huascar by order of atahualpa was quietly put to death atahualpa at liberty must in any event be to the spaniards no small menace but with huascar out of the way the menace was yet greater what should be done with him the general voice was for killing him against this some protested notably hernando de soto and had hernando pizarro been then in peru his protest probably would have backed that of de soto but the general voice so far prevailed that in august the inca was brought to trial some of the charges against him were unfair as for example that he was an idolater and that he kept concubines but two of them may have been genuinely conceived one that he had injured the spaniards by diverting part of his treasure and the other that he had done so by the murder of huascar a final charge there was and its genuineness was manifest to wit that he was plotting an insurrection against spanish rule the result of the proceedings was that atahualpa was found guilty and was condemned to death at the stake but on his recanting his own faith and professing himself a christian his sentence was commuted at night on august twenty nine fifteen hundred and thirty three in the plaza of caxa marca he was strangled with a bowstring for the march to cuzco all at last was clear a start was set for early in september and when the day arrived loud did the spanish bugles shout from their golden throats no more uncertainty no more delay ho now for el dorado ho for regal cuzco and the temple of the sun the way along the quito cuzco road was precipitous and owing to the cliffs and stairways chasms and raging torrents the latter spanned only by swaying bridges of osier the spanish force of nearly five hundred men had much ado to keep a footing 
nor was this all on the march the conqueror was much harassed by indian attacks and suspecting these to be instigated by one of atahualpa's captains chaucuchima by name whom he had with him as a hostage he ruthlessly destroyed that worthy by burning him at the stake pizarro entered cuzco two hours before sunset on november fifteenth fifteen hundred and thirty three a year to a day from the time when he had entered caxamarca how did this capital of the incas look to him situated a hundred and fifty miles northwest of titicaca it lay in a valley dominated by steep hills and distant mountains on one of the hills reposed a huge cyclopean fortress Sacsayhuaman, accentuated by towers square and round a relic of that megalithic or great stone age which preceded the inca period but what presumably attracted pizarro most were the structures of the town itself the palaces and temples wherein lay the treasure grouped in the main about a plaza with heavy inward sloping stone walls pierced by doorways broader at bottom than top they made a picture that was curiously egyptian these buildings were numerous too for not only was the town large over a hundred thousand souls perhaps but when any great Cuscan died inca or nobleman his abode passed to no successor but was maintained in all respects as though he were yet alive far more than mexico tenochtitlan was Cuzco a holy city the supremacy there of one religious cult sun worship fostered monotheism and monotheism demanded a supreme temple hence that shrine of the sun noblest edifice in america since the days of splendor in yucatan a site of which the spaniards had so ardently craved there now it lay in a court of flowers one end rounded into an apse its outer wall embellished by a golden cornice three feet in depth pizarro must soon have visited the interior that interior whence largely had come the seven hundred golden plates and where now was to be seen the sun himself in the guise of a resplendent golden disc flanked by mummies of incas his departed children posed on golden thrones sustained by golden pedestals but in cuzco religion did not exhaust itself with one temple even though that temple was supreme the whole city reflected religion indeed was based upon it so true was this that the centre the polaris of the empire as distinguished from the four quarters was the centre of the plaza of cuzco here in the form of a golden vase was a fountain and about this before dawn on the day of the summer solstice peruvians were wont to gather by tribes to worship and to worship what not an image of the sun but the sun himself if perchance he should appear that he would appear was not taken for granted he might not would he show his face on this great day anxiety reigned dread even then over the mountains the silent herald dawn and following the sun all very splendid but not anything that pizarro saw or would have rejoiced in had he seen it to him no less than to father valverde the whole ceremony would have been utter infidelity rank idolatry a celebration to be straightway suppressed as in fact it was with regard to the treasure actually uncovered at cuzco or on the way thither slabs of silver twenty feet long by one foot broad gold enwrapped mummies of inca queens and other precious objects the quantity was vast but not so vast not by half as the quantity already divided almagro's men by waiting for their harvest until cuzco was reached did not fare as well as they would have fared at caxamarca certain it is though that they fared too well to show signs of discontent discontent on their part when it came as come it inevitably did was for a cause quite different three definite stages of the peruvian conquest there were that of preparation that of active hostilities and that of accomplishment it is however a peculiarity of this conquest that the last stage that of amassing treasure and of seizing dominion instead of following upon the state of active hostilities largely preceded it and gave rise to it now therefore for a glance at the stage of active hostilities here pizarro does not shine as he did in the preparatory stage of patience and endurance 
a new man dominates the scene pizarro's brother hernando hernando pizarro is ever a figure knightly and romantic unlike the rest of his family he was neither illegitimate nor ignorant though like them he was poor and had his way to make that he could be chivalrous appears from his attitude toward atahualpa an attitude shared by an associate hernando de soto in these of our pages devoted to mexico and peru three figures stand out as representatives of that chivalry illustrated in the amadis of gaul and satirized in don quixote not so much vasco nunez de baboa hernan cortez and francisco pizarro as rather juan de quijalva hernando de soto and hernando pizarro men whom we instinctively associate with scenes of the tourney with splintered spear shafts and shivered brands but hardly less with perfume and flowers that lightly rain from ladies hands hernando pizarro it was to cite an incident romantic as well as practical who on the expedition which he led to pachacamac gave the memorable order that the spanish horses were to be shod with silver in lieu of iron hernando pizarro too it was who as pizarro's emissary to spain performed with courtliness the duty of laying at the royal feet the incomparable riches of the incas a further duty in spain he discharged and one surely not lacking in chivalry he assented to and even promoted the interests of amagro whom he did not like by joining with the latter's agent in procuring for him along with the title of mariscal or marshal a grant of two hundred leagues beginning where pizarro's grant left off but where did pizarro's grant leave off to this question the answer involves much the story of peru to the death of amagro then to the imprisonment of hernando pizarro for that death and finally to the death of the conqueror himself returning from spain in the summer of fifteen hundred and thirty five hernando pizarro brought with him orders extending the jurisdiction of pizarro seventy leagues beyond the two hundred to the south of the river santiago earlier allotted him and bestowing upon him the title of marquis de las atavillos but already at cuzco it had come to almagro's knowledge and hence to pizarro's that the former had received a grant to the south of that of pizarro therefore the question did two hundred and seventy leagues south from the river santiago fall short of cuzco and so deliver that prize to almagro or beyond it and so confirm it to pizarro contending strenuously that cuzco fell to him almagro nevertheless soon after june fifteen hundred and thirty five set out for chile a land possibly richer than peru one in any event undeniably his to exploit de soto eager for adventure would fain have gone with the marshal but failed to gain consent there did go however an auxiliary party of natives under the chief medicine man of cuzco the villac umu such as between the partners pizarro and amagro was the situation when pizarro found himself beset by another difficulty the indians of peru were at last awake in behalf of their land and their religion of the ashes of their fathers and the temples of their gods they had begun against the spaniards a mighty revolt by the time this revolt broke forth on april eighteenth fifteen hundred and thirty six pizarro had accomplished three considerable undertakings or rather one such undertaking for the other two had been accomplished for him rather than by him late in fifteen hundred and thirty three or early in fifteen hundred and thirty four sebastian de banalcazar had seized quito then pedro de alvarado our earlier acquaintance blond and daredevil having heard of quito as a rich quarry had disembarked against it at caracas but had been headed off by amagro backed by benalcazar and for a consideration called his expenses had agreed to leave the country lastly on january sixth fifteen hundred and thirty five pizarro had founded as the capital of peru the city of lima but to seize the thread of our story on the execution of atahualpa pizarro found that while a captive inca might be an embarrassment no inca at all would be a greater embarrassment still he thereupon promptly filled the place of the dead inca 
by naming as his successor one of atahualpa's brothers toparca on the way to cuzco toparca died and a brother to the murdered huascar called manco inca coming forth to greet pizarro with professions of loyalty was accepted as inca and received the borla manco inca with studied indian craft disarmed spanish caution and laid deep and secret plans in fifteen hundred and thirty six hernando pizarro commanded in cuzco where were also his brothers juan and gonzalo and though by this time manco inca had in a measure betrayed his hand hernando in his chivalrous way treated him with confidence on the eighteenth of april manco in company with his chief medicine man who had left amagro quietly departed from cuzco on a pretext of visiting the burial place of juana Cacapac, and once beyond pizarro's reach summoned in council the caciques and war captains of peru i am resolved declared the inca to rid this land of every christian and shall first lay siege to cuzco then ordering to be brought two large golden vessels full of wine let such as are with me he exclaimed pledge themselves herein to the death the fight for cuzco centred around the huge fortress of Sacsayhuaman. this at first the indians were able to seize and hold by setting on fire the, the combustible thatch roofs of the town and so forcing the spaniards to huddle together in the plaza but after a week of mingled struggle and endurance the fortress was scaled and captured its last defender was a peruvian of giant size and prowess one of the war chiefs who had pledged himself in the wine this hero seeing all was lost sprinkled dust upon his head toward heaven then cast himself down upon the foe and so perished while hernando pizarro was defending cuzco his brother the conqueror was at lima his new capital here he was besieged but the country being level he was able to beat off the enemies by the aid of his horsemen his great concern was cuzco thither he dispatched what aid he could but with ill success for the party was intercepted and the severed heads of divers of them were thrown at hernando's feet but he did more he appealed for aid to the entire world of spanish america to panama to nicaragua to guatemala to new spain and to espaniola that is to say he appealed among others to pedro de alvarado and to hernan cortes and by cortes at least aid was sent in the struggle for cuzco indian warfare was exhibited to europeans on a scale hitherto unparalleled not alone were there warriors in countless masses such had there been in mexico not alone were there tossing crests waving banners and panoplies of featherwork such had there been in mexico not alone were there forests of long lances and battle axes edged with copper such things or similar had there been in mexico but there was displayed something besides something which in mexico had not been quite the same to wit real military intelligence though in general softer of fibre than the aztec both intellectually and physically the peruvian sometimes outdid the aztec in wit to the peruvian for example the white stranger was less a preternatural being than to the aztec the former too feared the horse somewhat less it is even said by herrera that so accustomed to the horse had the peruvian become by the time of the struggle for cuzco that he was occasionally to be seen on horseback himself a statement which sir arthur helps distinctly challenges but the circumstances most significant for us in the cuzco battles battles hotly contested for in one of them juan pizarro was killed are the skill the valour the caution the perseverance and the knightly bearing of hernando pizarro this capable leadership especially in its knightly aspect appears to an even higher degree however in the contest next to arise one in which the peruvian forces were divided between warring factions of the invading spaniards it was fifteen hundred and thirty seven and almagro was back from chile weary starved frost-bitten sun-blistered disillusioned and disgusted he had returned no more chasing of will-o'-the-wisps for him cuzco fell within his province he knew it so cuzco he would have 
seeking but failing to make friends with manco inca who lay with a strong force outside the city almagro overthrew him in fight and disregarding an armistice with hernando pizarro for an adjustment of boundaries by pilots on the stormy night of the eighth of april he stole into cusco and surprising hernando and gonzalo pizarro in their beds promptly seized them and imprisoned them in the temple of the sun the feud long maturing between the partners pizarro and almagro was now squarely at issue first almagro defeated pizarro's lieutenant alonzo de alvarado and thereby made his tenancy of cuzco secure next gaspar de espinosa luca's successor in the partnership arriving from panama sought to reconcile almagro with pizarro but died in the midst of his efforts then almagro becoming aware of pizarro's increasing force consented to arbitration over this the partners met embraced one another and wept there had in the past been many meetings of reconciliation between pizarro and almagro and at all of them tears had been freely shed once the partners had even had recourse to the church and had divided between them the host nor were these meetings all mere fustian and hypocrisy not at any rate with almagro old ugly scarred and of inferior physique he was at the same time capable of feeling and of manifesting the profoundest generosity despite tears and embraces the arbitration had not succeeded but a treaty was made whereby hernando and gonzalo pizarro were set at liberty on stipulation that the question of cusco be left to the king and that hernando pizarro leave peru within six weeks then suddenly there developed a further phase in the pizarro amagro feud hardly had the treaty been concluded when a messenger from spain brought word that each partner was to retain what he had already conquered and peopled both hereupon claimed to have conquered cuzco and pizarro having the stronger following declared the treaty annulled and prepared for battle the principal commanders on the side of pizarro who had himself withdrawn to lima on account of his years were hernando and gonzalo pizarro alonzo de alvarado and pedro de valdivia on the side of almagro there were almagro himself too much incapacitated to fight but watching the field from afar in a litter pedro de lerma a deserter from pizarro and above all rodrigo de organez a doughty implacable soldier trained under the constable of bourbon as for the forces they were nearly equal on pizarro's side some six hundred and fifty men and on almagro's six hundred and eighty whereof about two hundred and eighty and three hundred respectively were horsemen battle was joined on april sixth fifteen hundred and thirty eight a short way out of cuzco on the plains of salinas and by the encounter that took place such cavaliers as hernando pizarro rodrigo de organez and pedro de lerma must have been reminded of combats in the old world one circumstance however rendered it peculiarly a new world combat almagro's men divers of them wore corslets morions and arm pieces hammered out of silver by doubling the quantity of silver used as compared with iron they succeeded in producing so they said an armour as strong as that forged at milan in any event it was as pretty a melee of knights gentlemen and foot soldiers as one might wish to see for not only were their skill and prowess but as occurs not seldom in partnership readjustments a becoming amount of deadly animosity but more particularly what of hernando pizarro a very perfect gentle knight hernando was and as such careful of his appearance over his corslet he wore a surcoat of orange damask fastened to this was the cross of the order of santiago given him by the king and above his morion floated a tall white plume these embellishments looked well but there was more to them than that being a true sir knight he had wrongs to avenge and he wished his enemies to be able to distinguish him easily in the press and to have every opportunity to encounter him at one point only was he at a disadvantage and a bit of a don quixote he was not handsome he was tall which was well but his lips hung heavy and his nose was bulbous and red at the end the challenge of the flame-coloured surcoat and white plume did not pass unheeded pedro de lerma spurred against pizarro with whom his relations were peculiarly strained and pizarro spurred against lerma the lance of lerma took effect chiefly upon pizarro's horse forcing him back on his haunches and unseating the rider 
while pizarro's lance pierced his adversary's thigh indeed this special bout was a kind of ivanhoe and bryant de bois gilbert affair for neither combatant quite overcame the other and the unhorsed knight springing erect drew his sword to try conclusions on foot organez meanwhile grim and sinister was himself seeking bizarro his training had been in a harsh school which believed that dead men do not bite and when hernando was in amagro's power organez had urgently advised cutting off his head like richard of gloucester at bosworth field organez at salinas would seem to have been haunted by a presentiment that he was doomed to die first though he would kill the usurper pizarro his rushes therefore were headlong and fierce one cavalier whom from a bright surcoat he thought to be hernando he charged and ran through another he likewise pierced with his lance and a third he cut down with his sword then wounded in the head by a chain shot and his horse being down he yielded to numbers his sword he delivered up to one of pizarro's squires a cowardly fellow who stabbed his helpless prisoner to the heart throughout the battle the hills about the plains of salinas were covered by on-looking indians auxiliaries of almagro but they merely looked on and wondered and took no part the more the spaniards slaughtered one another the greater the gain to the natives and considering the numbers engaged the slaughter was great in less than two hours more than one hundred and fifty knights and foot-soldiers were killed outright lerma received seventeen wounds and escaped only to be murdered in his bed after the battle then came almagro's turn not that he was immediately made way with but was put in prison and treated with consideration in connection with his imprisonment severe criticism has been visited upon hernando pizarro in cuzco there were many almagrists and so long as their leader lived peril to the stability of the pizarro regime was imminent plots for the prisoner's liberation were rife under these circumstances hernando pizarro disregarding tears pleas for mercy and reminders of how his own life had been spared by amagro permitted the latter to be condemned to death whether in so doing hernando was actuated by a sense of duty or was simply displaying something of spanish primitivism a quality so conspicuous in pedrarius is a question on july eighth fifteen hundred and thirty eight diego de almagro was strangled in prison and the next day the body was shown in the plaza with the head cut off amagro dead was now more his partner's master than he had been when alive hernando pizarro sailed in fifteen hundred and thirty nine for spain to explain matters to the king he was however anticipated by a friend of the dead partner diego de alvarado and was coldly received alvarado on his part challenged hernando to mortal combat but died before the ordeal of battle could be essayed yet hernando pizarro did not escape punishment for the death of amagro but was shut up in the fortress of medina del campo where he was kept a prisoner for twenty years on leaving peru hernando pizarro had cautioned his brother the conqueror to beware the men of chile the almagris they formed a distinct element both in cuzco and in lima and at the latter place under the leadership of juan de rada the one-time follower of cortez dreamed and conspired against the conqueror's life finally on june twenty sixth fifteen hundred and forty one their plottings bore fruit on that day at noon to the number of eighteen or twenty they surprised pizarro in the government house and slew him in cold blood with the conqueror at the time were several persons notably his brother martin of alcantara the least prominent of the family but like all of them valiant and a good swordsman the onset of the conspirators was furious pizarro was not able so much as to secure the door against them or to put on his corslet martin fought desperately but was soon cut down thereupon pizarro wrapping his left arm in his cloak seized his sword and did bloody execution but at length receiving a thrust in the neck he fell to the floor Yezu exclaimed the fallen conqueror and tracing on the floor a cross in his own blood he bent to kiss it and so died of the four brothers of pizarro two were now dead and one was in permanent confinement in spain there was left in peru gonzalo pizarro only his career like that of the conqueror was chequered in fifteen hundred and forty in obedience to orders he had made exploration from the andes eastward on this expedition one of his lieutenants francisco de orellana sailed down a stream traversing a country where the women fought by the side of their husbands a country of amazons and at length passed into the atlantic ocean 
in fifteen hundred and forty four gonzalo pizarro made himself governor of peru he aspired it is said to become its absolute ruler and lord and had he but heeded the counsel of his master of the camp francisco de carayal he might have succeeded as it was in april fifteen hundred and forty eight he was defeated in battle by forces of the crown and was beheaded the same year in which gonzalo pizarro had gone eastward from quito another explorer pedro de valdivia had gone southward into chile and here on september three fifteen hundred and forty four he founded the city of valparaiso in fifteen forty seven valdivia returned to peru and was instrumental in bringing defeat on gonzalo pizarro with regard to the almagrist party on the execution of their leader they set up his natural son diego as governor but he was pronounced a rebel by the crown and in fifteen hundred and forty two after the death of his able supporter juan dorado was overthrown in battle captured and put to death in this conflict our old acquaintance pedro de candia was almagro's artillerist but falling under suspicion of treachery was ridden down and killed by almagro himself from among the interesting figures in peru under the pizarro regime there remains to be accounted for only the inca manco not long after his defeat by almagro he took refuge in a fastness of the andes the spot it is thought was the megalithic town of machu picchu whence the incas had sprung here with his concubines the virgins of the sun he kept court receiving and succoring outlawed spaniards beings no longer regarded by any indian as preternatural here too about fifteen hundred and forty four he died struck down it is said at a game of bowls by a spaniard with whom he had an altercation after fifteen hundred and forty five zeal for conquest in america on the part of spain tended perceptibly to die down as early as fifteen hundred and thirty five well within the lifetime of cortez who did not die till fifteen hundred and forty seven a viceroy had been sent to mexico one was sent to peru in fifteen hundred and forty three with these appointments government in spanish america gradually became more stable vast now seemingly was the interval since the day when responding to the lure of antilia of sipangu and of the cathay of marco polo columbus had set sail from palos for the land where the sunsets go end of chapter six end of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond